Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to have seen now that so many of you have already joined this conference. I hope there will be many more joining. I think we are still on time, but as I know, usually people are joining in the first five minutes of the conference. So I'm Cynthia Wagner from the Restina Foundation, and I will guide you to this conference today. I'm very happy that this year we have reached more than 300 registrations so far. And um, it's the fourth edition of our conference on a very special day today, but I will not say more because our welcome speech from Gilles Massen from the Christina Foundation, director of the Rintesina Foundation, he will just tell us why this is a special day today. And so welcome with me, uh, Gilles Massen, the director of the Christina Foundation, for doing a small welcome speech. Gilles, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Cynthia. And I see you're one of the few people being in Belval. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the fourth edition of the Data Privacy Day organized by the University of Luxembourg and the Rustina Foundation. I would have loved to see that I'm happy to see you all in Belval. Well, unfortunately, instead the event lives up to its name, and as you cannot even see who else is participating. And I promise see, and it, sorry. I promise that that kind of privacy was really not planned or intentional. Now, having this event online and only online is especially regrettable as we have today a remarkable anniversary to celebrate. You saw it perhaps in the slides, but today is the 40th anniversary uh, of the convention that is at the base of the European Data Privacy Day. While the convention with the rather poetic name of Convention 108, was the first legally binding international instrument in the data protection field. Elaborated by the Council of Europe, it is covering the rights of individuals as well as free flow of data between countries. Now, the treaty had been opened for signature on uh, the 28th of January in 1981, way before internet and Facebook were on any radar. Now, on that first day, it was signed by seven countries, one of it being Luxembourg, and the treaty entered into force about four and a half years later in 1985, when five countries had ratified. Well, this time Luxembourg was a bit slower here as the ratification took uh, until 1988. Now, despite its apparent age, the Convention 108 is very much alive and it has been updated in 2018 to cater for the challenges in the digital era. So it is now called, well, Convention 108 plus, uh, and it still serves as an example. The United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights to Privacy encourages all United Nations member states to accede to Convention 108 plus. Now, if it really will take off, remains to be seen, but it does have a lot of participation beyond Europe and the scope of the Council of Europe. Now, obviously, a lot has happened in the last 40 years. And yet, it feels as if it was only the GDPR that made personal data protection the unavoidable topic that it is today. Now, the benefits of the GDPR are definitely not to be understated. And I'm not even talking here about job security for a generation of lawyers or the sheer infinite reservoir of topics for conferences like this one. Now, perhaps one of the more intangible benefits is the ever-growing awareness of people of the value of their own data, especially when it's in the hand of someone else. Now, that, that situation is, is not anywhere near a good enough situation, at least lo as long as platforms like Facebook flourish completely unchecked. Well, not completely, but mainly unchecked. And to be honest, for me, it remains downright scaring what amount of personal data is held by mammoths like Facebook or Google. All that data given freely, perhaps unconsciously, uh, by its owners in exchange for mere convenience. Now, the issues, well, the issue roots deep. Often the protection of personal data is seen as relating only to the data subject. Now, for the individual, it is a fuzzy risk. I mean, most of the time, nothing bad comes out of it, at least not 
until the first identity theft. But hand enough personal data to one single entity, the threat moves over to society. No one should have the possibility to manipulate a lot of people, let alone by collecting enough data to make them transparent enough to become mere puppets. And yet, it is something we've seen happening over the last month and years. Now, as depressing as the situation might sometimes seem, there is the occasional ray of hope. Now, take, take the announcement of WhatsApp about its change in data handling. It provoked a rather unexpected outcry and sent people flocking to more privacy-preserving alternatives, up to a point where even Facebook got nervous and nervous enough to at least delay the new rules. So in this context, it is not really surprised that the time for new instant messaging platforms is ripe. And even if you're not exactly there yet, it is an opportunity for us to try to get some control back and put our chats, for example, on systems that are no longer monolithic, but federated and privacy preserving. Now, such systems are already deployed in several EU member states, and there is definitely hope that we will end up with a platform for everyone that is actually in line with European rights and values. But at the end of the day, to be honest, it will be again a fight against the lure of convenience. And it will be a gauge on how high data protection ranks with us individually and collectively. Now, my small excursion on the side of the data owner and its responsibility and behavior should not be seen as diminishing the role of the data collectors. Now, awareness is also growing on their side. Two of the upcoming presentations illustrate and explain the impact of data protection laws on research activities. Now, is it the burden? Well, without any doubt it is. It does cost some effort to do perfectly, well, to do everything by the book when you deal with personal data. Well, it is certainly not all bad and quite contrary. The process of identifying sensitive data, pondering consciously over what inform information is necessary and what is not, probably contributes to the overall quality of any research project. So it's not all bad. And yet, a burden still remains. It is more work to do. Now, this is a similar issue for many actors. But allow me to make a connection from research to law enforcement. Um, even with, uh, with special provisions, the GDPR increased the workload of both, or at the very least, their constraints. I don't think I will ever argue for lower data protection for anyone's sake, simply because that would lower the security for us all, collectively. In Europe, as a society, we decided through the processes that created and approved the GDPR that we want data protection and we want it to be efficient. And I cannot find anything wrong, wrong with that. However, what we forget a bit too often is that as society, we also want research or law enforcement to work and to be efficient. We tend to forget that their interest, our interest, needs to be considered and that any additional burden on one of them needs to be compensated just to keep the status quo. Implementing that compensation by reducing data protection requirements defeats completely the purpose of creating the protection in the first place. I mean, you don't build a bucket with holes, so we don't put up exceptions that weaken the goal that you want to achieve. So, for example, you should not mandate excessive data retention requirements either. And you should not listen to the sirens asking for broken encryption. That the mirage of backdooring encryption for the good creeps up again, especially in Brussels, horrifies me. It shows, again, how requests for compensation tend to be short-sighted and only try to carve out exceptions. What they should seek are ways to reconcile the different requests from society, privacy, security, search for knowledge. 
find the common ground without sacrificing one on the altar of the other? There might not be a simple answer to this. I mean, there never is, to be honest. But a common starting point are the resources. Having the people and the time to do a good job so that none of the values needs shortcuts. And that would be a very good start. Yes, it comes down to money, but yes, wanting something comes usually with a cost. So I'd like to conclude with an appeal. Whenever you, you everyone, are working with data protection rules, do not only focus on your wishes or constraints, but keep in mind the other side, the context. Whenever you feel restrained or hampered in your work, remember that what inconvenience you professionally protects you as an individual. And whenever you lobby for work on or even legislate for data protection, please integrate the other needs of society into your discussions, even or especially if your actions require compensation from somewhere else, from a different plane. Now, this said, I wish you a very interesting conference. I have no doubt that uh, it will be worthwhile. Um, so have a nice day and please stop using WhatsApp. Thank you very much, Jill. So um, our first speaker for today is Sandrine Munoz from the University of Luxembourg, and she will talk about data transfer into third countries in the context of academics. Sandrine, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Thank you very much to, 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 to Gilles for, for this very interesting uh, welcome um, speech and uh, to, to remind uh, that uh, the, the importance to, to, to coordinate, to, to, to think about the efficiency and uh, the, the rules of data protection. So I'm um, very happy to celebrate the fourth edition of um, the Data Privacy Day uh, today with all of you. So my speech will be about the international transfer of personal data in a context of research. So I think that, that we'll also um, see um, how we can um, harmonize the research and all the international um, aspect of the research and the, the legal um, instruments. So, as you know, the science and research have no borders. There are collaboration between partners inside and outside Europe, and the researchers and the academia uh, world also use uh, partners, providers located for online recruitment application from outside and inside Europe. So, we have to handle with the GDPR requirements related to the transfer of personal data to third countries. That is that we call more commonly the international transfer, because there are this collaboration outside the European Union with the, the, the community of research in Europe and outside Europe, and also has uh, the, the application, the, the platform have no border. They are also using tools that are not only with, from providers, not only located in Europe. But now I want to focus on the recent legal context. And I think on a very famous decision of the last summer of the European Court of Justice about this international transfer that is called SRAM2, and especially this decision was about the mechanism of international transfers. And as I say at the beginning, the science and research have no borders and are very concerned about this kind of um, decision and instrument um, available. So this decision invalidates uh, the privacy shields that was used um, a lot by Facebook, Google, and other 
big IT provider to has a mechanism of transfer uh, from Europe to USA of personal data. And this decision, what was interesting that this decision also provide additional clarification and requirements about the use of standard contractual clauses. So this decision was really about this mechanism of international transfer, because we know that in, uh, in, this, uh, in this world, we have a lot of connection, a lot of uh, transfer. And what is interesting, because the decision before the European Court of Justice was not about the standard contractual clauses, is that the, the courts say that even if there is the use of this standard contractual clause, very, very used in practice before this decision, is that it, it could be necessary to have supplemental guarantee in the data protection clauses. So, to give you a quick details about this case, I think that most of you already uh, know this trend to uh, case because it was uh, the, the conclusion of the court was um, expected from the data protection community is if I can say so it was and I will. Uh, I will link to what uh, Gilles said uh, during his welcome speech. It was um, Max Schrems which is an, who is an, um, a user of Facebook since 2008, and Facebook process um, user data in the United States. And the, it, it, it is a long case, and the original complaint is from um, 2015 with the Irish Data Protection Authority about the surveillance activities done by the, Intelli the USA Intelligence Agency. And the complaint of Mr. Schrem was that the law and practice in USA relating to the surveillance activities did not provide adequate protection for personal data of the user of Facebook that was transferred from European Union to USA. And also to underline that uh, the decision of the Court of Justice to invalidate the privacy shield that was used by uh, a lot of provider of platform uh, had an immediate effect. So that also had consequences for uh, the, the institution that use um, some tools, some platform on the internet that uh, was certified with the privacy shield. So what are the main consequences of this stream two decision? that all the transfer of personal data from European Union to USA based on the privacy shield are illegal. And the mechanism that uh, we, we, know, we know, that is the standard contractual clause that is also very used, can be used, was not declared invalid, but under some conditions. So the provider, until this decision, cannot argue anymore that they are privacy shield certified. So the strength was that the big IT or cloud provider already adapted the argument and proposed to add the standard contractual clauses in their data processing agreements. In the past, it was not the case, I would say, and some of them, I would say the majority, uh, argued that they, they were uh, privacy shield certified and did not accept to use the standard contractual clauses. So now, after this decision, we had an evolution. We had regulatory evolution related to the transfer of personal data to third countries. And I would say that it's also um, in, the, in the conclusion of the European Commission about uh, the assessment regarding GDPR last year that uh, they, 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 they undertake to, to uh, work on the modernization of the mechanism, the legal mechanism of international transfers. And I think that now we, we can see the, the, the clue of this. So um, after this decision, the European Data Protection Board, which is the body that um, guarantee the, the interpretation, the, the, the common interpretation of the GDPR and provide uh, numerous guidelines about uh, how to um, implement and to interpret the GDPR, they publish guidelines on the supplementary measure. 
That means that if for the transfer of personal data, the standard contractual clues are used. In some cases, it's mandatory to implement supplemental measure. So the public guidelines about the supplemental measure, I will detail afterwards to give you some examples. And in the 12th of November, the European Commission published uh, the, um, a draft of standard contractual clause for international transfer. We expected, honestly, because before we had the, the, the former standard contract clause, I will, I will detail afterwards. And it was quite fast, I would say. Um, the 14th of January, the European Data Protection Board and the European Data Protection Supervisor adopted the joint opinions of these new sets of standard contractual clauses, which are uh, an instrument, a legal instrument for, for these transfers. So uh, a quick focus on the standard contractual clause before the DDPR. So we, we had uh, um, the ones of uh, 2001 and 2004. It was between uh, controllers and the one of 2010 between controller and processor. That's mean that this kind of um, uh, last uh, standard contractual clauses can be used when uh, you, you, you are a controller, you process personal data and you have an IT provider that, that you can qualify as processor and um, you, you have an agreement, and in this agreement regarding GDPR, you also have if they were transfer of personal data, international transfer, if they are justified. In practice, in some cases, this clause were added. So now we have this new sets draft, and there were a consultation in uh, from November to, de to December, an open consultation. So we have this new draft set of standard contractual clauses after the DDPR, the European Commission published. So there is a decision, as uh, usually, about the contractual clauses and an annex with the standard contractual clauses. And why these new standard contractual clauses were adapted? Because it, it is necessary to adapt this clause to the technologies and to the DDPR, because the former versions was under the GDPR, even if we can continue to use it. And they did not cover uh, multiple scenario that we have in practice with the, the different um, transfer, international transfer of personal data. And it's also um, in the standard contractual clause, there is also a mechanism when you have, for example, um, if, we, if we take the example of Facebook, if we have um, a request for surveillance authorities, American one to Facebook, to get um, the data of an European user, a mechanism can be inserted in this uh, standard contractual clause, which was not the case in the past. So this standard, this new sets of standard contractual clause not yet adopted, um, for a C, a modular approach. You have a combination of general clause and with modular approach to match to the different scenario that can occur in the multiple uh, personal data transfer. So you have what we call the controller to controller, controller to processor, processor to processor, and processor to controller. Model three and four was not included in the past. I will give you an example in uh, academic uh, uh, word afterwards about this modular approach if we can try to if we want to to try to apply. But what uh, what the conclusion about about the, this uh, draft new set of um, European Commission from uh, the EDPB and the EDPS? The conclusion of uh, this um, European board is that. With the standard contractual clause, because th that was really the, the core topic, the level of the data subject protection is reinforced. The problem with the privacy shield is that the, the invalidation is also because it's considered that this level was not um, enough or equivalent to Europe. There is also the good point of introduction of specific module for each transfer scenario. 
But what they say, and uh, if I may, I share the, the, the point of view, it's necessary to clarify whether the standard contractor clause can include several modules in practice to see if in one contract of standard contractor clause we can include different situation or if it's necessary for each module, each situation to sign one set of standard contractor clause. I think that's really uh, important and uh, in, the, in the research community, in academic community, because in research we have a um, consortium of research. And in, with the, within this consortium of research, there are multiple actors inside and also outside the European Union to, because it's necessary for some research project to join the efforts to, to, to progress and to lead this research project. So I think that is really important for, for, for our community to, to, to get um, this practical answer. They also suggest the publication of flow charts and frequency as question. I think that is also very good for, for us to see how to apply this uh, new set of standard contractor clause. And to I think for the flow charts, I think the European Data Protection Board already did to, to help uh, the, um, the institution to, to determine uh, the different legal qualification of controller, processor, so on and so forth. And EDPB and EDPAs clarify that uh, the event when uh, the adoption, um, when we will have the adoption of the standard contractual clause, the recommendation to have supplemental measure to these um, agreements remain relevant. So now I want to give you an example of um, this modular approach apply to a research context. So we can imagine that we have a research institution A that is located in Europe that wants to lead a research project with an institution B located in Australia. So there will be a collection of personal data in Europe and in Australia, and the sharing of personal data will occur on both sides. And to complete this, uh, this scenario, this uh, scenario that came from my imagination, we have this research institution E and B that want to launch an application or a platform to collect personal data of research participants. I would say to do an online collection using the services of a provider C located in USA and having a sub processor D located in India. So how will would be this modular approach? So I think that we can we can apply this modular approach uh, to this case because we will have a transfer controller to controller between A and B because they are I would say it depends on the case but we can also imagine that they are joint controller because they decided to conduct the research they are controller because they decided to 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 uh, process personal data because it's necessary for the purpose of their research project and how to do so with the online recruitment, with other collections. So they are the time determining the means. And we will also have a transfer controller to processor between A, B and C. And I would say a transfer processor to processor between C and D. So we will have some question for the applicability of the standard contractual clause and of this um, modular approach and the frequently as question the guidance would be very relevant and useful for us so now after giving you this um, legal context this regulatory guidance and requirements what is expecting from organization regarding data transfer now i summarize but um that is a vision to see what you think that that what we think that that is expecting from organization first of all is to know your transfers because research collaboration can involve transfer of personal data with other partner located outside european union and eea or that can also uh, lead to use services of external provider located outside eu or who has which has an sub-processor that is located outside EU. So it's necessary to know in which country your partner 
or uh, your service provider or a sub subprocessor is located outside EU. But it's also necessary to check if the data transfer is adequate, relevant and limited to which is necessary in relation with the research project. That is not a, a global transfer. The second point is to check the transfer to tool that you rely on. And I will detail the different transfer tool. So it's necessary to check with the DPO or the legal officer in charge of data protection. If there is an adequacy decision, meaning an adequacy decision between European Union and the country where your partner or provider is located. An adequacy decision means that there is an, an agreement between European Union and a country where there were an assessment that concluded that uh, the law of this country offer the same level of protection than the GDPR. We have several examples. There is a list on the website of the CNPD and of European Commission. And we have uh, several examples like Switzerland, for example, where this transfer is free because there is guarantee. If there is not an adequacy decision, there are the appropriate safeguard or derogation, it's, and it's a case-by-case -case analysis. So, what are the appropriate safeguards? So we spoke about the standard contractual clause of European Commission and the new version to come. There is also there are also the binding corporate tools, which are rule apply for transfer within a group of companies, a code of conduct approved, not already to my knowledge, a mechanism of certification, ad hoc clauses, a specific contract of transfer, and so on. There is also the derogations. I would say that the most famous derogation to transfer personal data is the explicit consent of the data subject. But that means that, for example, if you are doing an online recruitment and you decided to use the services of an external provider who is located or who has a um, <clears throat> sub-processor, subcontracted located outside European Union. That means this explicit consent of the person means that the participant of this online recruitment must consent specifically to this um, transfer, to the international transfer, and uh, to provide it all information that are detailed by the European Data Protection about this transfer. Other derogation, I will not detail every of the derogation. Other derogation are if the transfer is necessary for the performance of the contract between the data subject and the, con the controller. And I will also want to, 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 to mention uh, the trans if the transfer is necessary for important reasons of public interest, because during um, in one of the guidance of European Data Protection Boards, for some transfer of personal data between uh, some American partners and uh, European research institutions like uh, European is the National Institute of Health American One. They, they, they said that it could be admitted that the fight against the COVID-19 could be considered an important reason of public interest. But regarding this derogation, derogation means strict interpretations. And it's not easy for organization to rely on it in practice. And we have the example of the consent, and the consent is revocable. So, third point, what is expected from organization regarding data transfer? The third point that is not an easy one is to assess if anything in the law or a practice of the third countries may affect the efficiency of the appropriate safeguards. So, if not, the transfer may occur with appropriate safeguards or derogations. And if yes, it's mandatory to implement additional measures. But I think because that is a relation between a data exporter in Europe and data importer in Europe, the, my advice is really to um, also to really discuss the different contractual provisions with the data important and uh, also to 
to get information about the law and to have guarantees from the data importer. And the last point is to identify and adopt supplementary measure. And the EDPB in their guidelines in mid-January provided example. The, the, the supplemental measures are technical, contractual and organizational measure. On, on the side of the technical measure, I think that is, that is interesting for the academic world because encryption is mentioned to transfer encrypted data under a specific requirement because it's for sure it's necessary to have robustness of the keys. So, so one of the solutions, if it's possible, is to uh, transfer encrypted data. And the other one is that pseudonymization, transfer of pseudonymized data. And I think that these both techniques are already used in some research projects. On the other side, there are this uh, additional contractual measure. And I think this, uh, this uh, recommendation match with some already good practice. And I hope that if it's not the case, that will also allow to, to evolve, um, um, to, to be a support for the practice to evolve on this, on the agreement that, uh, that is um, which, with the partners or with the, the provider. So to, to ask for contractual additional contractual measure to, to require the technical measure, the transparency of the importer, and the certification of the importer that he did not create backdoors. But I would say that this additional contractual measure much more for service provider than for um, partner in, in, uh, in research. And also what they call the empowering that are subject to the side that writes. That means that, that that is only possible if the cooperation with the data importer is on a vol voluntary basis. That means that if the I don't know if a public authority in the third country asks for personal data of um, a user or of a participant, um, it would be necessary to inform and to get the consent of the exporter. But it's not possible in all the cases. And the last, uh, the last one is the organizational measure that's meant to be organized in, in an institution to, to have policies and to be organized about this transfer of personal data. To be able to, 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 to allocate the responsibilities, to have reporting channels, to have standard operational procedure to detect this transfer and to know how to deal with. So now I want to, to, to give you um, a conclusion about this uh, very specific topic, but I think it was a very um, important topic uh, last year. And uh, we are, I think we are also concerned about this international transfer because science and research, as I say, have no borders. I think that for other activities, that is already the case. So I have some tips to, to, to share with you. I would say that um, I would advise to check if your collaboration or if the service provider that you want to use the, the, the services is involved in, in involve international transfer of personal data and not to assume that they will not occur and to involve the relevant stakeholders, the DPO, the CISO, uh, your manager, uh, IT department, so on and so forth, and not to involve them to the last minute. And to discuss with them the appropriate legal instruments and the supplemental measure for this transfer. And that is a case-by-case -case analysis. We can, uh, we can have trends, but it's necessary really to have a case-by-case -case analysis. And not to leave the implementation to the last minute and to presume that all measures will be in the agreements. So, thank you very much for, for your attention about this. I think that we have now, uh, I would say, one or two minutes for if you have um, any question about the international transfer in an academic context. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, so if you have any questions, you can write them in the question and answer in the Q&A sections here in WebEx, or you can write it in the chat. So it's as you like, uh, in the question and answers, you can contact uh, Sandrine immediately if you'd like to and uh, send her your questions. If you don't find the question and answer section, you can also write them in the chat. We will forward them then to Sandrine Winos in order to reply to your questions. I think for the moment there are no questions in the chat right now. We have two questions in the room. So I hand over to the technical part and they can read out the questions then and Sandrine, maybe you can answer them then. My pleasure, yeah. Sandrine, you did already see the question? Uh, no. Okay, so the, the first question is, what are the compliance implications when a data subject cannot freely provide because he or she as a student researcher is forced to use tools provided by the university? So, for example, WebEx or Microsoft 365, which transfers data to countries that do not have an adequacy. For, for, the, tool, uh, for the tool used by the university, um, so the students are not forced because the consent for the transfer of personal data is a derogation. So there is, as, a, a, as I explained, but I know that it's quite complex, there is other tools. So for the tools used by the university, that the, this transfer of personal data outside the European Union was assessed and uh, we adopted the, the, the agreements to, to get this guarantee and we also did assessment about this. So. Uh, we discussed this question with these companies. So the, the, the students are not forced. The, the, um, for, with this tool, with WebEx and uh, Microsoft Teams, the tools are, we, we adopted the standard contract clause and we discussed with this partner the, the guarantees. And we did not base um, the, this transfer on the consent of the of the student or on, of the staff. So I hope that's replied to, to these questions. Okay, thank you, Sandrine. Uh, another question just to share with the audience is we will share the slides after the event on the event website. Yeah, for sure. Mm. And I, I think this international transfer of personal data is really um, a moving issue at the moment because we receive a very recent uh, the decision of the court is uh, from last summer, but they, we receive uh, there is a really a regulatory evolution and also providing uh, guidance from um, European Data Protection Board and European Data Protection Supervisory. The new set of standard contracts close from uh, the European Commission that are under a draft at the moment. So there is, I think, in the commitments, it, it will evolve. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much for, for the question. Yeah. Um, as there are no more questions, um, maybe we move to the next speaker. Yes, of course. Uh, our so thank you, Sandri. Uh, our next speaker is Marc Lammer from the CNPD, and he will talk today about how COVID-19 shaped their work in 2020. So Marc Lammer, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm trying to make sure that uh, this, the screen is shared. One moment. Can you see my slides? Not yet. Not yet, sorry. Share. Okay. Now oh, it should be back. Now, okay. So, um, good morning to everybody. I am very happy to um, to uh, be with you on this uh, important day for data protection. Um, um, thank you also, and to to these very interesting introductory words of uh, Gilles Masson uh, on, uh, on on the value of data. I think this is something um, which is finally at the top of or in the core of. Uh, the problem of data protection, um, and also obviously on, on for Sandrine uh, uh, on her intervention on international data transfer uh, 
uh, obviously, I, as a representative of the CNPD, I could uh, uh, talk uh, on this, uh, a very important matter indeed, and I can only ensure you that uh, the CNPD, as being part of the European Data Protection Board, is obviously heavily involved in um, making things um, advanced in the ways how to handle this um, um, situation. However, um, I choose not to enter into these technical um, considerations. Um, um, I choose to uh, have a uh, more general view about the activities of the CNPD because we think at the CNPD that our activities are not so um, well known and this gives a good opportunity to do it. Um, also, um, because, um, also because, um, well, I'm not a lawyer, so uh, I'm coming from the world of research, innovation and entrepreneurship. And um, so this is an area where um, I spent many years and this is a curve. Um, I'm sure many people at the university and in innovation uh, are familiar with. And um, uh, so it's a curse, the Gartner curve, which is a kind of a representation on the maturity of the adoption of a new um, technology or a new application where it starts really uh, when there's an, there is nothing and then initially excitement and then there's an, a peak of it and then it goes down in some kind of dis disillusionment and then it goes up again to a certain level of uh, maturity and so um, looking back now on two years and a bit more of GDPR uh, I felt that this type of graph describes this, the, the state of adoption of this new uh, legal framework. Uh, GDPR was a kind of an innovation, although data protection legal frameworks were exist existing already before uh, the GDPR. Um, there was an important initial excitement shortly before and after uh, the effect of uh, the regulation, um, as well at the level of the citizens and, uh, and, and the organizations. Um, citizens seems to be quite uh, not only interested but already really knowledgeable about their rights as uh, this is uh, uh, as the figures from the Eurobarometer Euro studies are, are, are showing it um, and uh, private and public organizations are also or have been in really an excitement phase when installing their DPOs and taking uh, actions uh, towards conformity on the GDPR. So, um, but how is this uh, uh, situation has involved? How seriously do organizations consider data protection and privacy today? Um, what is the level of maturity um, regarding uh, this protection and privacy? How much really concerned uh, are subjects and, um, uh, uh, and subject and public and private organizations today? Um, is this interest still as strong as it was uh, or is there any loosening? Um, and, and also there's the question, how did DPA, so uh, authorities like the CNPD and others, adapt to this new regulation framework? Um, as these uh, authorities, as the CNPD existed already long before the GDPR, they needed also to adapt uh, their new missions and uh, to this new um, framework. And so this is uh, the, the thing I wanted to, 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 talk, to, in, to talk to you in, in the first part and then um, give a kind of an, um, uh, an, uh, an, an overview about our activities um, within the framework of the COVID-19 crisis, which, uh, which heavily shaped also our activities, uh, like uh, the ones of all organizations. Um, and I will give uh, on this an insight from the national, but also European uh, view, and ending up with some conclusions and coming back to this uh, Gartner curve with some uh, conclusions. So, um, as said, uh, most DPAs in Europe uh, existed uh, already long before uh, GDPR. Uh, the CNPD was created in, in, in 2020, uh, 2002. Um, like many um, regulatory bodies in other areas, their mission is about uh, uh, informing, guiding, controlling, and now also enforcing. Um, main activities are uh, awareness rising, uh, guidance, um, conformity tools, which are new with GDPR, handling complaints, uh, following up complaints, organizing inspections, and up to, uh, to sanctions. 
uh, but these activities are um, these activities are not all new some are new but uh, mostly were already existing but what is important is uh, so as gdpr is not an um, in french you would say in france uh, but it's an, an a very important tool to make our culture of how we deal with our data how we deal with personal data of individuals um, how to make this change in this world where the physical reality is merging with the digital uh, reality so it's about change management and for doing this we need as 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 authority um, make uh, these interactions between activities more um, stronger um, so um, this is why we in 2019 and in 2020 we uh, we set up an, an, a new organization and uh, and this started uh, last year um so one of the um, outcomes was by uh, very early so one year ago to set up a new organization where a new organization where we are now um, uh, organized along five core um, businesses i would say um, sensibilization, so awareness rising, uh, guidance, uh, conformity tools, uh, um, complaints, and um, inspections. Um, we have a two-level uh, um, organization, so uh, these basic uh, activities um, within the CNPD. Um, the CNPD is headed by uh, the college of four commissioners. Um, which is the management tool of the of the of the CNPD, but we have also an um, an uh, 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 college which is um, sitting in formation restreinte, who is the institution uh, taking the decisions um, of the CNPD on inquiries and on uh, the result of inspections, uh, which might lead to. Um, uh, to, uh, to sanctions and um, this is um, one of the new uh, features of the of the of our organization um, beside the organization uh, organizational new setting we uh, adapted all adopted also an, uh, a set of uh, new internal regulations so um, how uh, investigations are uh, organized proceeded uh, how uh, complaints are filed, um, but also other uh, types of um, uh, internal organizations. Um, we have also uh, set up some newer uh, activities uh, around guidance, awareness rising, uh, and uh, technology watch and legal watch. Um, one thing I want to highlight here with this slide is our um, very strong involvement at the European level uh, and uh, in, in EU cooperation at the level of the EDPB. Um, in this field, at least, um, uh, in um, helping to uh, develop, uh, to draft new guidelines. And uh, uh, the ones you, which are listed here, are uh, the examples of guidelines which have been um, uh, published by the EDPB um, over the last uh, few years. Uh, there are others which are uh, in the in the pipeline. Um, one of which I can uh, tell uh, you is about virtual voice assistance, which is obviously very interesting uh, also in uh, the technology world. And uh, this is something where we are um, uh, heavily involved in. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is uh, one very important um, activity. Um, we have uh, awareness rising and uh, training activities, which we had already before, but we want to give them an, uh, an, uh, an, a bigger uh, consideration uh, in, the, in the years to come. Um, a very new tool, and uh, I saw it in the slides of Sandrine Munoz very briefly uh, before, uh, is certification, codes of conducts, and uh, DPIAs, which are uh, tools which are new uh, within the GDPR, um, or which are new, uh, let's say, in, uh, in, uh, uh, which are new by the, the, the GDPR. 
um, we are the CDNPD is um, particularly strongly involved in the certification. So setting up the schemes, uh, the procedures, how in Europe and also in Luxembourg um, uh, certification uh, can work, and um, this is a process which is um, uh, now coming slowly to an end. So getting starting to get visible, I would say for. Uh, for the organizations, um, hopefully before end of this first half uh, year. Some figures um, which are quite uh, new from over the last years, uh, just to show what is intensity of our, some of our activities on um, information requests um, for example, where we uh, observe a continuous growth over the years, uh, with obviously in 2018 an, an, uh, an important peak, as it was the year of the adoption of, not the adoption, but the, uh, entering into, uh, <clears throat> into force of the GDPR. Um, we have in, on average between 40 and 80 um, uh, information requests over uh, per month. Um, um, that was the case in 2020, um, and there was a peak, obviously, in April and June, when uh, we were at the core of the COVID uh, confinement, or the first confinement phase. Um, main topics on information requests are, beside COVID-19, and I will come back to this uh, in the second part, um, on the legal base, on the right of erasure, the right of access, uh, many questions about HR processes in, in companies and um, a topic which is always coming up is video surveillance. Um, on the data breaches, uh, you see the figures here. Um, we have an average of um, around 9, 29, 30 notifications per month. Uh, most uh, are from, uh, from human error, so this is still 65% of all the cases. And um, in terms of, uh, of complaints, there's a considerable increase um, in 2018, 2019, 2020. It went down a little bit, but still at a very high level. Um, half of all national complaints received um, is linked to the non-respect of the data controller of uh, uh, the right to access or the right to of erasure of, the, of a person. Uh, from around 450 complaints received in 2020, three quarter uh, are national and one quarter uh, international. And um, maybe also to say that uh, a bit more than half of all these complaints received ended up in corrective uh, measures enforced with with the processor. Um, our resources um, went up because of well because of the, the, the new um, work we, we, we need to do uh, and um, so we are obviously happy to be um, uh, to get um, to get the budgets to do this and to recruit uh, people we are now uh, 40 48 um, uh, of uh, at the CNPD um, and uh, five years ago we were uh, 25 or at least even even less than 25 people so strong increase also meaning a much much change management organization changes in our um, in our structure i don't want to go into the cnpd work program we set up for ourselves for uh, for the years 20 up to 2020 um, uh, maybe um, Maybe one is, I, I would say, I would highlight one uh, specifically. It's the last one, uh, the launching of the activities of the Formation Restreinte, where um, decisions are taken on sanctions, I will, as I explained before. Um, this is something which is awaited. Um, the CMPD cannot obviously talk about these things, but um, um, we are coming up uh, uh, to an end of many of, of inspections and uh, these inspections or the results of these inspections are now up to the level of the formation restaurant which um, is starting now to take um, the first decisions and um, and uh, so this will be an, uh, an, uh, something which will get some visibility uh, at one moment or the other 
uh, at national and also uh, international level. Well, um, COVID-19, main issues observed. Um, I start with something very, let's say, common, I would say, for everybody uh, today. Uh, in all of your organizations, everybody experienced more or less things like I'm trying try to, to summarize up here. Uh, so the internal, internal um, organization to ensure business continuity. So without going into the details of these different phases, but uh, um, we, um, we had to, to go through it. Um, it was uh, quite impressive how quickly uh, we moved to 100% homeworking right at the beginning of the confinement and then move to different phases of uh, uh, A, B groups, 50-50% that one day coming back to uh, full to the office and then uh, being now again uh, in, in these 50-50 split groups. Um, but this worked uh, quite well. We had to we had the challenge, the additional challenge to also move into new offices. Um, so for confinement, we moved out of our old offices and for uh, coming back, we moved directly into our new offices. So uh, handling this project was also a bit of a challenge. And I would say the biggest challenge is, and I I'm sure all of you also have to live with this is uh, recruiting, welcoming, integrating new collaborators. Uh, we recruited, I think, over this period, um, over half a dozen. If I include uh, the ones we recruited by end of the year before, we are easily at um, 10, 12 people which need to, to be integrated in the teams and with uh, homeworking, um, that's not uh, always so, so easy. So more interestingly, uh, I would say that uh, regarding the, the role and the mission of the CNPD, there were a number of, and the diversity of data protection topics we were facing and which popped up um, quite quickly in the early weeks and even before the first lockdown. Um, such data collection and uh, processing uh, as, I, uh, we, as the ones which are listed here, um, including uh, the ones like um, uh, contact tracing or uh, uh, general health surveillance. Um, these topics are, uh, are let's say, include um, the collection of a uh, vast amount of uh, uh, personal data and uh, non-personal data. Um, besides the fundamental question, if such data processing is lawful, necessary, uh, appropriate, proportionate and secure this, always the question whether uh, what happens when these same data are processed for purposes um, which are not directly related to the pandemic response or, or, or what happens when uh, some emergency measures introduced to address the pandemic such as uh, manual or digital contact tracing are turned into a standard practice after the decline of the pandemic. Um, to avoid uh, that such measures uh, could have significant effects beyond the initial crisis uh, response phase, um, potentially leading to infringement of uh, fundamental human rights and freedoms, uh, DPAs in, in, in Europe uh, and across the globe played their role as, as watchdogs. Uh, GDPR proved to be a flexible framework uh, that allows for technological solutions and innovations like tracing apps, infrared cameras, uh, social media, uh, video conferencing systems, etc., to be compatible with um, protection of personal data and, and, and privacy. So what, one of general conclusions on what we saw there is uh, to, as a kind of an advice um, on adopting uh, best practices, uh, applying due diligence and conduct uh, impact assessments, um, maybe DPAs if it's assumed to be necessary. Uh, but to do this before implementation and integrate it into uh, this type of due diligence into the general business and company risk analysis. Uh, another uh, advice is to base your developments on privacy by design and, uh, and default principles. And then also adhere where it is possible to uh, codes of conduct, uh, which have been set, are set, or maybe will be set up uh, in different sectors or or, or um, in, in different uh, uh, activity fields. So um, 
these were the issues observed. Now, what activities were triggered on our on our side? I, I do not want to present the details of the recommendations or opinions of the CNPD, um, which we produced regarding the COVID-19 related topics um, as we observed them. You can discover those on, on, on our website. Um, it's just about to highlight what have been our activities and uh, and and involvement. So, um, answering information requests on the different subjects uh, which were on our on the slide before, um, giving guidance um, by uh, recommendations we have issued, but also um, as it will be shown in the next slide, uh, opinions on success on successive COVID nineteen laws. Uh, awareness rising and communication uh, frequent uh, by frequently updating our our website but also by launching uh, on-site inspection campaigns around COVID-19 um, and mostly I, I think we had very strong involvement at the European level on cooperation and international um, um, collaboration and more specifically I, I, I would like to illustrate this with four examples so as one is as the first one is about contact tracing app and um, as you remember there was an intense discussion on whether luxembourg should uh, also develop and implement a digital application for for contact tracing and shortly after the government decision for for the first confinement um, the cnpd set up a small team uh, for technological and legal watch on uh, this topic and interacted uh, intensively at, at the European level with our colleagues. Um, we also interacted at, at, at different occasions with the Research Luxembourg uh, Task Force and with the governmental expert group in order to uh, give input uh, regarding uh, the issues uh, on, on data protection and mostly how to establish and deploy an, um, a methodology uh, to identify risks uh, based on, on, on impact assessments. Um, another uh, major activity during, uh, during this, this, this time, and this is obviously something which is going on um, even today, it's giving opinions on the COVID laws, on the successive COVID laws. I, uh, I counted here eight um, interventions from our, from our site. The challenge here was, um, I mean, this is something we are used to. We are giving opinions uh, asked or not asked uh, to uh, law or um, propositions from the government uh, of, of new laws. Um, um, here the challenge was to, have, to, to be very, very quick and to be very reactive in order to fit into the general mechanism to, um, well, to, to, to try to manage uh, uh, as good as possible the crisis by setting the right legal basis, I would say. And here we, um, we, we did, I think, a very, a very good job. Um, and third uh, type of examples here is, uh, well, the, rec the recommendations. Um, so let me first talk about uh, the legal obligations of employers and employees. And, and again, without going now into any detailed considerations, um, the question was very often, what are the obligations in this hectic period uh, where there was and still is much uncertainty, um, um, mostly even at the beginning of this crisis and certainly um, after the first uh, lockdown. Uh, so in the business environment, uh, in, in private or, or public entities, um, there, there is always these legal obligations to guarantee um, health and safety of, of the employees at the, at the workplace. And um, so in order to, to limit the risks, um, these um, institutions or the institutions um, should uh, implement uh, prevention, information uh, and, and, and training to, to, um, uh, to issue internal instructions um, to, to this end. And um, so the CNPD invites the employers to, uh, to consult um, what is 
uh, giving on on the sites of of ETM, so on the inspectorate of labor uh, of labor and and mines, and also also of, of the of the internet side of the the government to check these sites on a regular basis in order to know what are the obligations um, as an employer. Uh, towards um, guaranteeing health and safety issues. This is not something which is related to the CNPD as such, but this is the type of recommendation we are we are giving. Um, on, from our side, as a simple message is here uh, that um, these public and private entities uh, they may process personal data in accordance with the GDPR um, when it is strictly necessary for the compliance of their legal obligations. Um, so it's about to remind their employees and agents um, who work, uh, or whose work brings them in contact with other persons um, of their obligation to inform either the employer or the health inspection of a contamination or suspicion, um, but for the sole purpose of enabling the employer to adapt working conditions and not more. Um, or to invite uh, the employees to consult doctor or refer them to uh, the health inspection and encourage uh, to use uh, remote working. So there should be no initiatives going beyond um, this level of, of, um, of, of activities. Um, on the processing of personal data by uh, employers, um, it's sure that there are um, uh, that there are many personal data which um, can be looked at, um, but uh, only the ones which are strictly necessary for compliance with their legal obligations uh, in accordance to labor law uh, should be processed. Um, thus, these entities may only um, process elements linked to the medical uh, doctor certificate. However, uh, public and private entities cannot compile files or treatments uh, relating to health data uh, linked to COVID-19, even if the employee informs his employer voluntarily uh, that um, he or she has been tested positive uh, for the virus, or that uh, he or she thinks uh, to present um, symptoms of, of the disease. Um, entities also cannot collect files or data containing the body temperature of their employees or agents. Um, so this also should be um, should be limited or is uh, prohibited. Um, furthermore, it's uh, not their role to carry out investigations or contact tracing. Uh, this is a task which definitely falls into the hands of the health inspection. Um, and uh, yes, so this is, should not be the um, activity of, uh, of the employer. So um, at home office, uh, there have also been, um, I mean, this is a major issue uh, uh, or reality uh, when we look at, uh, at, 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 at the pandemic, how we work today. Um, so uh, here also, it's about to uh, well to 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 handle to to find the right balance um, between um, the information the information flow, which is necessary to make um, uh, the organization's work done, uh, and the measures to ensure uh, confidentiality and the security of uh, of processing the data. Um, only processing uh, the personal data which are strictly necessary for compliance uh, with legal obligations. Um, this is the recommendation we are, we are giving here. Um, we got uh, numerous requests uh, here in, 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 the, in, let's say, on the general question of, uh, of uh, working at home when it came to um, the video conferencing systems uh, in the context of remote work and linked to this, um, the surveillance of employees at, uh, at, at home office. Um, also, another uh, activity, as I mentioned before, is on-site inspections. This is something we are, the CNPD is um, 
organizing, let's say, all over the, over the year, uh, organizing different type of campaigns. Um, so we launched the uh, end of the last year an investigation campaign on how organizations uh, are processing personal data um, to uh, specifically for COVID-19 uh, surveillance. So uh, collection of personal data via questionnaires and also uh, uh, a specific look on um, body temperature checks. Um, so it focuses all type of data subjects, employees, obviously, but also clients, providers, participants. Uh, the objective is to, to, to check how organizations are implementing the COVID-19 recommendations and the information actions uh, from, from the CNPD. Um, the methodology is, is you know, let's say, common. We are, we are using uh, here. We, we, we need to make sure to have an, a sampling which is, um, which is representative. Uh, we choose 20 organizations based in Luxembourg across um, socio or different socioeconomic sectors, uh, small, smaller companies, uh, larger organizations, and obviously it is executed according our internal investigation uh, procedure. Um, now, um, we also have a very strong involvement, and I mentioned it already several times at the European level uh, on COVID-19 specifically. Um, we contributed to the guidelines which CDPB um, uh, produced and published very early uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the pandemic in April uh, on the processing of data concerning health uh, for the purpose of scientific research in the context of COVID-19 outbreak and the second one on, um, on the contact tracing tools. Um, this is also an, uh, uh, an area where uh, we have been uh, uh, involved at the international level uh, with DPAs uh, worldwide, where there have been um, a lot of, of, well, a lot of uh, half a dozen of webinars which have been organized around different uh, type of topics. You can discover them here, but also on contact tracing, um, for example, but also other uh, areas. Um, one interesting output uh, of, um, I think it, there have been uh, 30 uh, organizations, DPAs uh, in the world, which uh, produced a kind of a compendium on best practices um, in different uh, member countries on um, how, what, is, what are the best and most privacy respective responses to, to COVID-19. Um, so it was really interesting to see how how everybody um, felt to sit into uh, one uh, in, in the same boat and, uh, and, um, and moving forward in the good direction. So uh, as a type of a conclusion um, and coming back to the curve, uh, I, I, I mentioned in the, at the beginning, um, it's clear that, and this is at least really uh, the conclusions, not from the CNPD, but generally the GDPR is not an obstacle in, in the fight against the pandemic um, and the development of new technologies. Um, it's, uh, it's proved to be a guarantee for safeguarding human rights in, in democratic states. Um, the public and individuals have even higher expectations regarding the protection of their personal data. And um, I think that organizations which uh, implemented GDPR thoroughly before the pandemic um, were um, able to manage data protection challenges during this crisis substantially better compared to organizations with only few effort done before. Um, but also at the level of the supervisor authorities, um, I think um, it was interesting to see uh, how agile um, and collaborative uh, it was to work together and to uh, uh, continue developing guidelines um, uh, and uh, uh, cross-border inspections, uh, including enforcement actions. Um, there is still space for improvement, but um, much have been done. And uh, I think we are on a good uh, path moving forward in this direction. So thank you very much. Sorry for um, having taken um, some more minutes of my time. Uh, and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Mark. We do
two questions. So uh, I will pass to technical part again uh, in order to read you the questions, except if you see them in the question and answers uh, section. Yeah, so thank you. The, the first question um, says, since May 25th, 2018, GDPR has become mandatory. Several fines have been imposed on several organizations in Europe countries, including our direct neighbors. So far, none in Luxembourg, at least to the website enforcementtracker.com. How to interpret these indicators? Okay, my camera. Sorry, I, uh, I I had a technical problem here. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, I would say not to interpret the ease indicators, but the question I think directly is uh, how it comes that in Luxembourg no uh, enforcement or sanctions have been um, um, have been taken. First of all, there have been um, many enforcement which have been taken by corrective measures uh, already before the GDPR, but also over the last uh, years. Um, but these very visible um, uh, sanctions with financial uh, uh, with, with financial uh, uh, with financial sanctions, um, indeed, um, nothing was yet. Um, uh, let's say um, uh, no decision were, were, were yet taken or are yet taken. Um, but as I was saying, um, the pipeline is quite uh, is quite full as we launched. Uh, campaigns uh, in 2018, 2019. Um, it took some time in order to um, move through, uh, let's say, these campaigns. And um, there are uh, uh, the first, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, inspections and the first cases um, where there will be uh, sanctions um, will come uh, this year. One important point, and that's a different, uh, very important difference towards many other countries, is that uh, our national law uh, of the CNPD is not allowing the CNPD to talk uh, uh, about, uh, publicly talk uh, about these things. We are uh, under the uh, professional secrecy, uh, specifically in our law, and so it makes us, and also it will make us, when we have taken uh, decisions and sanctions, um, quite impossible to talk about it, um, but uh, I can assure you that um, um, many things are going on, and uh, I'm sure 2021 20, uh, um, there will be um, uh, sanctions which are which are coming. Okay, thank you. The the next question: um, Will the which data protection lab workshops are planned for 2021? Will these be advertised on the CMPD website? Yes, for sure. We we have, I must admit, um, um, not, let's say, a an, an final uh, uh, planning. Uh, we had planned uh, several for last year. By, well, by, by the situation, we had to cancel them. Um, but there will be definitely uh, DAPRO Labs, this is uh, the name of them, Data Protection Laboratory, Open Dab Laboratories. Um, they, will be, um, they will be announced on our internet site according to the same procedures as we, um, we had them uh, before. Um, also, uh, we need to switch to, um, to the webinar mode. This is also something new. We need we needed to find our way there also and uh, uh, I think we found it now and and uh, so I can uh, confirm that there will be uh, further uh, DAP prolapse and also other awareness rising uh, activities over the year. Um, one, one more question maybe because we have plenty of them maybe I will um, relay them to Mr. Lemmer afterwards so we can come with back pleasure. one more to give. Will the CMPD help data controllers with DPIAs so that they won't need to rely on vendors' assurances, often biased, that their products, platforms are GDPR compliant and publish the results of those DPIAs? Um, no, that's not our role. Um, the GDPR is very clear on this. So um, it's not uh, the role of 
not only the CNPD but also of other authorities to uh, to help with the DPIA. I remember, I, I recall that the, the major, um, let's say, the, the major feature of the GDPR is uh, the accountability. So putting responsibility into the hands of the organization. So the organizations must find uh, their way because also each case is different. Now, as a as a supervisor authority, we cannot take uh, up each case with an uh, uh, with an individual organizations in a B2B relationship and uh, and, and, and help moving them um, uh, uh, through the process of assessing their risk. Uh, this must be done by, um, by, by the organization. Um, when the organization decides that there is, um, they think that there is a need for a DPIA, um, we have, um, we are helping, well, not, not we are helping, but we are assessing uh, the uh, final residual risk, uh, which might, which is needed to be assessed, and at that moment, this is an official, uh, um, let's say, an official action taken by the by the CNPD. Uh, I don't think that um, we will uh, publish uh, these um, uh, these results, as I was saying before. Uh, these things are not. Um, uh, are always falling under uh, the, uh, the, the professional secrecy of the CNPD and um, uh, this will certainly not be done. However, I could imagine that uh, collecting, let's say, best practices, worst practices and bringing them and discussing them in the DAPRO labs, uh, as mentioned before, this could be uh, probably an interesting way how to share uh, how to share uh, um, what we are seeing and, and, and help with guidance to the different uh, sectors. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have a couple of other questions, but I will share them with you afterwards because we are really late on our timing. So we need to, to continue with the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. And also, thank you very much to all the participants who questions so we will come back to you later at that point uh, about questions but now I have to uh, introduce our next speaker who is Vincent Valence from Nota Dottil and he will speak about how to deal with personal data in the context of R&D collaboration agreements. Welcome Vincent Valence, the floor is yours. Thank you. So thank you very much uh, to Restina and, uh, and the University of Luxembourg. Uh, sorry for the, uh, for the small delay to work properly when testing and uh, now I couldn't get to the uh, to the platform anymore. So um, uh, many thanks for uh, uh, for joining uh, this webinar. I will discussing I will be discussing the, the personal data protection compliance in uh, research and development uh, collaborations. I think that is a very important uh, point uh, when dealing um, within a university context. And uh, what we have seen there is uh, when assisting uh, many clients in the field of R&D collaboration, that uh, there is already uh, a basic problem in terms of the right qualification of the, of the shareholders, of, of all the stakeholders. So, uh, and if you do not get that qualification of all stakeholders correctly uh, within an R&D collaboration, uh, then, of course, your uh, GDPR compliance uh, exercise is uh, doomed to fail. So, when we're talking about the different stakeholders within uh, an R&D collaboration, it can, be, uh, it can be a lab, it can be uh, a, a specific, specific department of, of the university. Uh, within Luxembourg, it can one, uh, be one of the public uh, research centers. It can also be an industrial partner. So, but all uh, of these stakeholders, they need actually a kind of qualification uh, when, uh, when the research project concerns uh, the processing of personal data, which is often the case, of course, in, in, in life science uh, research, but also in socioeconomic research. And there you have uh, the different options. So, first of all, uh, all uh, stakeholders uh, would be, can be qualified as what we call them single controllers, which means that they each of the stakeholders have to, has the has the obligation to fully comply with the GDPR. Uh, each of the stakeholders, and very often we see, especially in a Luxembourg context, that uh, 
some of the stakeholders are also sitting in another EU member state. Um, there, uh, that's a bit tricky because uh, a lot of member states have, even when the GDPR is harmonizing data protection law, um, the GDPR has allowed member states to adopt specific provisions in the field of uh, research. And these can be quite uh, divergent. So that means that uh, every stakeholder, when you're a single controller, must abide by, uh, the, uh, by his national rules on uh, data protection in the field of research. Uh, when we have single controllers, uh, very often we have the different stakeholders, but there are still data flows between the stakeholders. So it can very well be that uh, stakeholder A, uh, for example, um, an industrial player in the pharma industry has already collected uh, some data and then transfers the data to Another stakeholder, for example, a um, um, uh, department within uh, within of the part with uh, one of the participating universities. In that case, uh, some national legislation, for example, the Belgian one, obliges you to have a kind of data sharing agreement from one uh, controller to another. Then we have a notion of uh, joint controllers. Uh, that means we will have a, a deep dive into that notion uh, later on, but uh, that means that you will uh, jointly de determine the purposes and the means of, of, of a research project. And there, of course, each and any of the controllers will also have to fully abide by the GDPR, but uh, because they do it jointly, they can also organize uh, internally within the joint controllership uh, some tasks of compliance. We will uh, come back on that. The downside of uh, joint controllership is um, that uh, you have a lot of controllers and who, and if they are sitting in different EU member states, they all have to follow their own rules on, on, on uh, national rules on research uh, and data protection aspects. And that for one particular project, it can be very well be if you have a Belgian partner, a Luxembourg partner, and an Austrian partner, that you actually have to abide by all these three legislations. And we will see on the next slide that uh, these legislations in terms of, uh, of uh, research and data protection, they can be quite divergent. If you are, have joint controllers, you also have to have a joint controllership agreement. Uh, where you actually define in detail the roles and responsibilities of the different uh, controllers. What we often see in uh, R&D collaboration, so that uh, there is a lot of contractual stuff uh, about uh, the repartition of IP, etc., but there is not, not always that much about uh, the, the division of the roles and responsibilities uh, when it comes to data protection. Uh, when you have a joint controllership, uh, the data subject, so the persons uh, whose data are processed, uh, uh, have the right to be informed about the key elements of the joint controllership agreement. And even when you have a, a setting where you have joint controllers and where you can allocate uh, some tasks of compliance to a controller, joint controller A and another one to joint controller B, um, it, is, uh, it is explicitly mentioned in the GDPR that the data subjects can exercise their rights of, of access, information, uh, rectification towards each, each and any of the joint controllers. So that is also um, an, an aspect to note. And then you also have a third qualification, uh, which, are, which is the data processor. So data processor will be an entity uh, within the, the, the collaboration. Um, who only uh, acts actually on the instructions of the data controller. And it can be, uh, be a huge difference for an entity, whether it's controller or data processor, because a data processor only has to comply with very specific uh, provisions of the GDPR, which are aimed at processors. For example, it has to implement sufficient security measures. Uh, in some circumstances, it has to appoint a DPO, it also has to keep a processing record, but it obviously does not have um, to, uh, to, to fully comply with the GDPR as a, as a data controller would be, because it's a data controller 
who is the primary responsible of uh, GDPR compliance. If you have a data processor within the collaboration, uh, you need to conclude a so-called data processing agreement uh, with the data processor. Uh, there is good news on the way because the European Commission has just published a draft of standard clauses that, uh, that uh, different stakeholders can use in that respect. So a standard data processing agreement, which is deemed to be uh, in compliance with, um, with data protection laws. And of course, the data processor as such um, will not be subject to all these national research provisions of the country of its establishment. So, for example, if you have a Belgian uh, data processor um, of, and a, a Luxembourg data controller in the field of research, it's a data controller who has to uh, abide by the Luxembourg rules and see and assure that they are complied with. But uh, the whole, uh, all Belgian provisions on, on, uh, on research and data protection will not have to be uh, complied with. So if we have a zoom now uh, on, on these national specific provisions on research, it's very interesting to see. Just to give you an idea, uh, for example, in Belgium, um, the, the, the data protection law that complements and implements the GDPR uh, allows to have some derogations from uh, some data subject rights uh, when you are dealing with uh, uh, research, uh, with data processing in the field of research. But uh, it also uh, foresees some specific safeguards. For example, the, the data controller that is uh, subject to Belgian uh, data protection law, and that's normally a controller that is established in Belgium. Uh, it has to keep a special record of processing activities for health, uh, uh, for, um, for research purposes, uh, with the justification when uh, a decision is made to, uh, to make an exception to some data subject rights, uh, then there also has to be a justification, and the justification needs to be uh, included in the special record of processing activities. So, um, Belgian law also foresees uh, a data sharing agreement between uh, the initial controller and also uh, other stakeholders towards whom uh, the data may be, uh, may be transferred. Yeah? So, typically, as I said, uh, if you have a pharmaceutical company who has already collected some of the data, um, if, it, if these data are interesting for research purposes and they have to be transferred to another stakeholder within the R&D collaboration, uh, then uh, between the two uh, controllers, a data sharing agreement must be concluded. Uh, when we turn to Luxembourg law, Luxembourg law also has very specific provisions on, um, on data protection and research. Uh, uh, Luxembourg law also allows to have some derogation from uh, some data subject rights, so the, the right to be informed, uh, the right to, to, to access, uh, access data, etc. Uh, and it has foreseen some a full list of, uh, of safeguards that need to be uh, implemented when uh, a data controller that is subject to, uh, uh, to Luxembourg law, for example, uh, the university for its research activities, but also LISER, LEH, LIH, and, 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 and other entities that are established in Luxembourg. So uh, they, in principle, need to implement, uh, carry out a DPIA, so a data protection impact analysis. They have to appoint a DPO. Uh, when uh, they proceed to anonymization and pseudonymization, uh, which is also required, they need to rely on a trusted third party. Uh, they have to use privacy enhancing technology, etc. So uh, that's a full list of, of very specific things that need to be complied with uh, if you undertake a research project with uh, where one of the stakeholders is established in Luxembourg. Uh, for all these particular points, you can ask a justification that you don't have to abide by it, but the justification must be really uh, 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 bulletproof. So um, that is also um, a, a point of, com of, uh, of attention to be taken into account. Uh, then I also took the example of Austria. 
Again, Austrian law also uh, allows for derogation for from some data subject rights when in the context of uh, of research. And there, uh, Austrian law, for example, provides uh, if the data subject uh, did not give its his or her consent, uh, that you need a prior authorization in principle from uh, from the data protection authorities. Of course, uh, I put these on the slides and. Uh, uh, to each of the rules, uh, some exception, ex some exceptions exist. But uh, imagine that you would have a, a research project um, with stakeholders of these three countries. You see already from the list that uh, uh, that there are a lot of uh, things to be taken into account, and that uh, that they can be quite uh, divergent. So uh, now turning back to the qualification of, uh, of the different stakeholders data protection wise. Um, so the joint controllers, um, that's when you have a situation where you have different actors uh, within, um, uh, um, within the R&D collaboration that determine jointly the purposes of the processing. The purpose is why, why do I process this data? And then the means of the processing, that's the, the how, how I do it. Um, and if you have uh, a joint determination of, uh, of different stakeholders, then actually you have a joint controllership. Uh, the EDPP, that is the, the European organization, uh, that's European Data Protection Board, which regroups um, uh, representatives of all uh, data protection authorities in the EU, uh, has provided some guidance on uh, the notions of controller, processor, um, etc., and has also indicated that uh, there is a joint controllership. Uh, it has some, given some guidance on that. So when there are converging decisions, and then it comes with a kind of a, a legal test, which is uh, very broad. So we have actually converging decisions when you have complementing decisions having a tangible impact on the determination of purposes and means of the processing. Uh, that's still understandable. That uh, that uh, that matches up with converging decisions and determining jointly purposes and means. But then it goes on and it says uh, that it's important to see whether the processing would not be possible without both parties or or more parties' participation. So if the processing by each party is inseparable or uh, or, or or inextricably linked. And, and that last test, of course, that, uh, that makes uh, the notion of joint controllership uh, very broad, because, of course, in, uh, in R&D collaborations, uh, you have many settings where, in my opinion, you have rather successive uh, controllers. So uh, a party A has already a data set and transfer it to party B, who needs it for, uh, of course, for research purposes, but for its own purposes. Um, how you would see that uh, for me, the processing by party B is inseparable from, from the processing of party A because without the, the processing of party A, the processing by party B would not have been possible. Uh, we will uh, go back in a minute that, uh, that the, the notion of joint controllership cannot be um, interpreted uh, in, in such a, a, a large manner. Then you have also uh, the case where you could have single controllers within an R&D uh, uh, setting. So that means where all the different uh, stakeholders determine alone the purposes and the means of, uh, of, of the processing. And then you also have the case where uh, maybe one or more uh, stakeholders may have the rule of data processor. So that's where they act uh, on behalf and on exclusive instruction of the controllers. Uh, so that means that they do not need the data for uh, for their own purposes, and uh, the EDPB has uh, uh, given some guidance that a data processor can also take to a limited extent a decision on what we call them non-essential means. So the data processor cannot uh, decide um, uh, which data subjects will be in in the in the processing or which data will be. Um, uh, will be processed, uh, how long uh, they can be processed, but it can um, it can uh, take some decisions on 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 some technical non-essential means, 
the EDPB says, uh, yeah, it can decide on which software to use uh, uh, within a project, etc. Uh, it remains to be seen whether that, uh, depending on the on the importance of the software, whether that is still a non-essential means. But uh, the EDPB has given some guidance that that the data processor may take some decisions on uh, on some uh, non-essential means. In terms of qualification of stakeholders, the EDPB also has uh, given an example in its guidelines, uh, which applies to R&D. So where you have um, a research project by different institutes and uh, they actually uh, uh, keep a, a common platform and uh, each of the institutes feeds its own uh, personal data set in uh, to the platform for the purposes of a joint research project. Um, there, the, the injection and, and, and the management of the platform and, and the use within the joint research project for that part, uh, the institutes will uh, be joint controllers. However, it's also possible, uh, and, and that needs another layer of compliance, that each of the institutes may also need the personal data for, uh, for other own purposes. And for those other own purposes, uh, they are uh, a separate and, and not joint controller. Um, when publishing the guidelines, uh, the EPB has also put a draft for consultation. And um, the Luxembourg National, National GDPR Working Group for Research, which regroups representatives from uh, the public centers for research, but also um, uh, some representatives of the university have uh, have contributed to that. Uh, and they also have uh, raised some very interesting questions on uh, the notion of uh, controllership, uh, uh, joint controllership, uh, etc. And um, they actually had uh, two extreme uh, cases, and I, I, I very like uh, very much like them. So normally, in order to be a data controller, you must um, determine the uh, the purposes, so the why of the processing, and also at least the essential means or how you will uh, process it. And uh, there, the uh, the, the, the Luxembourg National GDPR Working Group for Research has has uh, has come up with uh, two realistic scenarios, uh, where and um, where in a scenario A you have a um, actually a um, a situation where uh, one party uh, can actually uh, uh, determine the the purposes of the of uh, here a clinical trial. Um, but um, but maybe also not the um, um, and and that they have jointly determined the means eh? because in a clinical trial or on a research project you also have a protocol and here you have actually a party A who alone has determined actually the purpose but you have a party A and B who worked also on the essential means. Uh, i.e. Uh, the definition of the protocol of a clinical uh, trial. So um, it's not clear, uh, stemming from the EDP guidelines, uh, uh, how this situation uh, should be approached, whether uh, A and B are nevertheless uh, joint controllers or uh, how you have to approach that situation. Uh, then you also have another extreme uh, scenario and that's uh, uh, that's more coming from uh, the socio-economic uh, research, where sometimes you see that ministries they they actually uh, they uh, they request uh, a public research center to uh, uh, to to carry out a, a certain study, um, but they say yeah ju just uh, do a study in that field, but it uh, it is actually the public research organization. Who will say, well, actually, uh, we need that data set, uh, and we will uh, we will deploy these and these and these means. And there you have an extreme situation where the purposes are of the processing are determined by the ministry because the ministry gives the order or uh, request actually that study. And without that order for a study, 
the public research organization itself would not have uh, have carried out the, the, the study and eh, because uh, the, the ministry also um, gives uh, most probably a financial grant to the public research organization. But the research organization actually uh, fully determines the means. So there you would have an extreme situation where potentially you would have no controller at all because you have a the ministry who determines the purposes but not the means and then you have party b who only determines uh, solely and exclusively determines the means without implication of the uh, of, of, of the ministry so these are also situations and i hope that the edpp will also come with some uh, some extra guidance in, in 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 this respect but these are also concrete concrete cases um, that are uh, raised in, in in practice and that could be a problem to give a right qualification to who is now controller who is data processor and if you have more controllers are they joint controllers in this respect uh, it's also worth to mention that the in the edbp guidelines you see that the the edp guidelines have been heavily influenced by uh one particular case of the court of, well a few cases but uh, the most uh, important one in, in my opinion and and which is also a very interesting one is actually the uh, the case of the court of justice of the european union in the case uh, fashion id and that's a decision about the roles of a website operator and facebook when the website operator uh, uh, decides to embed a Facebook-like social plug plugin uh, in the website. And with, I will spare you the, the technical uh, details, but uh, you have some good takeaways which have a direct impact also uh, in the context of a research and development uh, collaboration. First of all, the Court of Justice has repeated its uh, uh, earlier case law that you do not have you do not need an access to data in order to qualify as a data controller okay so uh, from the moment that you determine the purposes and the means of the processing if you have control on that you do not even need uh, an access to the data to qualify as a data controller it's quite strict but it's a case law in that case the court concluded also to a joint controllership because there was a mutual commercial uh, benefit um, of the website operator and Facebook to collect and transmit the data. But the Court of Justice also said that the joint controllership is only limited to the data collection and transmission. And in this case, uh, when deploying a Facebook, Facebook like social plugin, after the collection of that data and the transmission of data, uh, there is also uh, another exploitation by Facebook of these data. For that further exploitation, Facebook is a sole controller. So you see, it's getting very uh, complicated. And that is also one of the uh, big points of that judgment that the, the data protection compliance uh, gets a bit more complicated because things that, or, or activities that are classically, traditionally considered to be one single processing activity, the Court of Justice has admitted actually the, the idea that you can slice up a, a particular uh, uh, processing of data and that you can slice it up in phases and that within each of the phases, your role can, um, uh, can be different. So in the case of Facebook and Fashion Idea, that was they were joint controllers at the data collection but not for the further exploitation of the data. It has uh, uh, big ramifications because um, if you are sole controller, a single controller, each must ensure its own uh, compliance. Whereas, for example, in the case of uh, joint controllership, you can uh, uh, jointly actually organize your, uh, your consent and information obligations. And there the Court of Justice has said that it's preferably if you need to ask for consent to the data subject, or if you have to, and, and you have to inform him, then it's prefer, preferably to do so at, uh, at the time of the first contact. So if you have a big uh, R&D collaboration with many stakeholders, uh, the first uh, who collects the data 
uh, should actually uh, inform the data subject and collect the consent if required. Uh, of course, uh, we know that in the field of research, there could be exceptions to the obligation to inform data subject, but, uh, but it's still a, a point that has to be taken away. The fact that you are joint controllers does not mean that uh, only one joint control only one of the controllers needs uh, a basis of lawful processing. There, the Court of Justice has said that even when you have a joint controllership, that each and any of the stakeholders need, uh, uh, need their own basis of lawful processing. And depending also on the laws in the different uh, EU member states, uh, for example, when you deal with health data, it could very well be that one institution or one stakeholder needs uh, the prior consent of the data subject. And that, for example, university, uh, when uh, processing data in the field of research, can rely on, uh, on public interest as a, as a lawful basis of processing. And there the Court of Justice has said, even when you do it jointly, uh, each and any of the controllers needs its own uh, basis of uh, lawful processing. So that's, uh, uh, that's also an interesting insight. Um, also very important is that in more and more in research projects, for example, in Horizon 22 uh, projects, you need to submit a data management plan. It's also uh, getting standard, more and more standard in, in, in research projects. Um, if you recollect the, the slide with the specific Luxembourg provisions, that's also one of the safeguards you have to implement when you rely on a derogation. Um, that you have to have a, a proper uh, data management plan. And that data management plan, in my opinion, is very crucial because it gives a correct reflection on the roles and responsibilities uh, of the parties. And it will be uh, have a pivotal rule, uh, role in the, in, in the further compliance with uh, data protection laws. It will have an impact on how you have to draft your privacy notice, how you have to draft consent language, it also, when you need to carry out the DPIA, it is clear that, uh, that the data that are uh, included in the data management plan and the DPIA, they must actually be uh, synchronized. And the same is true uh, between the data processing record that you have to keep in the data management plan. So uh, last slide, uh, some, some, some useful resources, probably uh, you, you know about the GDPR, but I also included some. Uh, so some other uh, nice uh, uh, sources that can that can help you uh, in assuring compliance and in, in having the the right qualification of the different uh, stakeholders in in R and D uh, collaboration. So uh, that's it uh, from my end. If you have uh, specific questions, uh, don't hesitate. Uh, yes, thank you, Vincent. Um, we already have one question. What are the legal mechanisms on subsequent exchanges for different purposes and data controllers to be put in place by the initial data controller? That is a, that is a very uh, good question. Um, of course, the initial data controller has a big, um, has a, has an important role because, of course, if it uh, envisages at a certain point of time to to transfer data, um, it also has to inform the data subject about that potential further transfer. Um, also, in the, the EDPB has also issued some guidance on that. That, of course, if it's possible, you have to be as precise as possible also on the final addressees of the uh, uh, of the transferred data. So you often see in in privacy policies that uh, uh, that uh, that we work with categories of addressees. Uh, if you know which addressees it's going to be, it would not be bad to uh, to give already any, uh, a more specific indication on that. So the the, the key point there is also is already the. Uh, the correct information uh, that starts with the first uh, data controller. And then it's also important that the successive data controllers, they are a data controller of their own, and they also have to uh, comply with uh, some information obligations towards the data subject. So 
um, it will be very rare that uh, that the data subject is fully enlightened by the privacy notice of the first data controller, um, especially if the identity of the addressees is kept fake. And if you transfer it into a, another data controller, which is very precise, yeah, the, the, the data subject needs to know who that other data controller is. And the data controller also, in principle, I say in principle, has to inform the data subject. I say in principle here because in the field of research, as you know, you can also, um, if it's absolutely necessary for the research project, you can some, sometimes deviate from, uh, uh, from some uh, uh, data subject rights. Okay, thank you, Vincent. Thank you very much, Vincent. So, thank you for having participated. Uh, thank you for having joined us as a speakers today. Um, I would say thank in the next time for a small break. So, in order to catch up with our delay, I would suggest to meet back at 11.15. So, you still have five minutes to grab a coffee. <laughs> More than enough in a visual conference. So, I hope to see you back in five minutes. Thank, thank you. Welcome back, everybody. So it's now an honor to introduce uh, Michael Hoffman from uh, where am I now? Uh, from APDL, who will speak to us today about how to implement technically the right to be forgotten. So, Michael, I would say the floor is yours. So uh, thank you very much for the uh, for the opportunity uh, and that uh, we as APDL can present a bit on very practical aspects. Uh, of uh, GDPR because it is less the paper elements which is really a trouble. The big element is, of course, it's all the electronic data which we have been talking about up to this point, and that's the key point. So, having said that, uh, there's a there is of course one of the key elements is well, how about dealing with data retention in an effective way uh, uh, since this is quite of complicated. And so, uh, I will have about uh, 20 minutes to get you a bit through uh, with uh, how this can be done, what do we see setting the scene, but also to remind you APDL is really a great organization with a lot of working groups and uh, please join us, uh, it's really nice people. So having said that, uh, so I will go through the different aspects of uh, um, retention, structured data, unstructured data, solutions, automation elements. All right, so let's start. So the problem, what is it? Uh, the problem is uh, where we see it, uh, of course, uh, uh, very much in, also in a private environment. Uh, you, there's a mixture today of uh, systems which are on premises, on clouds, on, on off-site hubs, uh, high number of uh, um, uh, databases, application, data warehouse, data lakes, uh, that's, uh, structures which we know, and then of course we have also the non-structured data, which IT is normally a little bit less uh, confident in terms of when to delete data, uh, meaning uh, um, that is everything concerning mails, file servers, and this kind of things on site, on 360 or cloud, uh, that's the reality. As this is not enough, these systems are, of course, highly interconnected uh, and interfaced, meaning there's all kinds of rules to be respected and how you delete, there are certain sequences on it, uh, and how the systems are working on online batch and so on. And if that is not the last of the problems on this field, then we have something what we call end user computing. So, which means uh, uh, that the users can do between the Excel and macros accesses and so on. Uh, and so that's the environment, meaning in short, if you want to delete data, it doesn't help you if you delete it in, in a master file and that's it of the application, but it needs to be deleted out of the organization. And so how to do that? And uh, that's what the topic of today, and that's where I want to get you through to it. So clearly for new systems, it's a bit more less complicated because but this is the, the least, uh, 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 the, the, the lower problem because the, the reality is the, uh, we have a lot of existing systems uh, which might not have had the uh, privacy by design uh, put into it. Uh, all right, uh, so let me then go to uh, the next page. So how to do it? 
So from a methodology point of view, it's very simple. Methodology wise is simple. Well, you clean up your data and for everything coming in on a day to day, you revisit the data governance and set up of it. Easily that. Uh, uh, I will come to the practical implications to it and how to do it. Uh, for the new systems, of course, you should never, you should always have in your RFP processes that there is previously by default and design be uh, 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 capable. Otherwise, you might just continue the trouble going forward uh, on that. So, to, how to put efficient and data retention policies in? So, meaning, I take the assumption that the companies or the organizations do have already data privacy. Um, the retention policies, at least from a procedural and legal point of view. So now the big issue is, so IT just do that, please. And that's where the trouble starts because it's not so trivial. Uh, so how to start? First of all, you need very specific high performance tooling because it is impossible to do that on a manual way. Uh, there might be hundreds of databases, applications, and so on. Uh, it's just not feasible to do that in a one-to-one -one, uh, element. But it starts with the simple point is how to identify them first. Uh, uh, um, and how and that is more than just looking to find the master file uh, of uh, client information and just be, is trying to delete it. Again, uh, for the technicians on on the call, deletion might, might most of the case not be an option due to integrity of uh, the databases afterwards. So meaning there might be in reality a mix which needs to be implemented between certain parts which can be deleted, other parts which can be anonymized. And again, I insisting anonymization in the context of GDPR really means that the data is not only replaced with alphanumeric signs, a denominative data, but it means it cannot be retraced uh, uh, if you use a, a server system together. So you basically indirectly you can find the name again. So which is the problem to basically trying to be comprehensive in the deletion. So this needs to be done with high accuracy, therefore, and complete, but also with high speed. Because uh, to do that, uh, to run standard queries on some of the bigger applications and systems you might have, it would take so much consumption of resources that basically uh, the organization would stop working, uh, uh, and that's not an option. Uh, um, so then, of course, as I was talking about the mapping, uh, the lesion analyzation, and of course, once you have all done all that, well, you need to have some assurances actually done as well, uh, which means you cannot use toolings uh, which identify your data and you just get a nice set of additional data which you then forget to uh, delete and then uh, it was worthwhile. So maybe just a little word on unstructured data. So unstructured, what it means, just be clear. You need systems who can do basically a bit everything already on unstructured. So meaning Microsoft, Google, Apple's, uh, uh, the communication channels, the file shares or file servers, uh, uh, and of course, all these on-prem hybrid and on cloud. So uh, which makes it quite complex. Uh, um, but good news, it is possible. And that's why we're going to talk about it to give you some practical stuff uh, uh, on that. First of all, uh, so what needs to be done, of course, Data privacy is, needs to be fully aligned with data security as well. Uh, um, a, by, it's necessary by the, of course, by the regulations, but B, it cannot be just on top something which is not working together correctly. The next thing is how identify and uh, how to treat data because data is by itself not just Michael Hoffman, but the data need, means it needs to be in order to have the correct retention, have the correct action, be contextualized, uh, which makes it quite more tricky than just to say, find me Michael Hoffman and delete that Michael Hoffman. So uh, classification is one element and we, there's quite a few more which you need to have in order to have it effective. And I will tell that in a minute. 
Uh, second of all, uh, um, you would then uh, need to go certain alignments of risk, uh, but that uh, I'm gonna just for the purpose of time, I'm gonna skip a bit and then it starts. So then you start with discovery, labeling, and that all automated integration alerting because the whole thing on the GDP on the technical side is just, it's not just a one shot. It needs to work on a permanent basis and it needs to be somewhere in an effective, efficient way, and which means uh, as much as it does not need to be manual, needs to be implemented, otherwise it will never be able to do something effectively or extremely costly. So all manual things are actually super costly. So having said all that as an introduction, so now the key element is so what are the solutions? Uh, uh, so is the solutions, what are the solutions, what you should look for? Uh, no worry, we, I will not sell you an EY solution. This is not the purpose. And here is uh, the vice president of uh, Affiliel. So I give you some of the stuff, how it works. So uh, on the graphics, you see a bit of this kind of fully automated solutions, which are extremely powerful. So meaning, uh, starting with uh, discovery, you have not only a lot of sources uh, and a lot of terabytes, quite obviously, uh, but also on top of it is a dynamic uh, um, the whole thing. So what do you need? You need a system, which and there exists, uh, that's maybe I should mention. <laughs> you need a system which can do, so as we said, structured data and unstructured data. You need a system which do it online and not trying to make a lot of thousands of copies of uh, the research uh, uh, elements on it, because you're just creating more uh, personal data during you trying to eliminate them. And technically, you need two things in particular. You need one thing that you can see all or nearly all the different uh, technical solutions that you have in place in terms of application and databases. So even if a system is super good in, let's call it SAP or, or whatever, wonderful, if we cannot cover the rest, you always having just partial work be done. And so you need something who can really do that. So this means you need a solutions which are basically native data privacy built uh, rather than many of, of uh, uh, um, cyber uh, uh, solutions or IT security solutions, which have been a bit enhanced on the GDPR side, which cover also very well certain aspects of it. So there's also an opaque tooling, but you might not get uh, everything which you actually do need. Now, uh, um, last element on it is you cannot use traditional technologies in that you would just search for it and running incredible uh, uh, um, queries on in your entire databases of all your systems. So you need to have also the acquired uh, uh, modern technologies, meaning you need to have intelligent index, intelligence uh, uh, in it, artificial intelligence in order to discover in order to have it a two-tier approach that he actually can by itself dis discover the databases and the, the table structures without a human intervention and basically try, uh, le having a learning algorithm in it which can find the, 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 the personal data quite quickly so which means searches will be can be limited to specific tables in specific applications without having heavy APIs to be created. So this reduces quite significantly already the search, but of course, this is not enough at all. <laughs> like the technician on the call will be probably agreeing with me. Then you need, of course, the next level, which means you need then applications which have then more, more than uh, less uh, computer resources consuming engines uh, like Docker and this kind of stuff in order to be able physically to be doing it and you still can work on a day to day without bringing the systems into the into the needs and the whole organization by the way as well <laughs> so uh, so we are just now uh, uh, on the discovery invention so that's how it looks 
that's the two links which you can see on the on, on the screen. Uh, so now let me just make one little sentence to uh, contextualize because till now it's rather very blunt. Okay, maybe easier with specific uh, artificial intelligence and learning uh, algorithms, but still it would just find a name like Hoffman or all the other uh, PIs. PIs uh, uh, more easily, more efficiently, more modern, and more smart. Uh, however, that this doesn't still not be able to do the data retention element on it as well, because you need to know not only the workflows of the data, as you see above, but also below, you need actually to contextualize the data by itself. Give an example. Yeah. You would, uh, so uh, uh, the data subject might be uh, somebody in Europe, of course, uh, let's say Germany. He might have using from the organization uh, uh, data centers, which are somewhere else. And he might be actually in a very specific context within the organization. So, for example, have him subscribed uh, uh, um, policies uh, or, or contractual arrangements uh, which fall under uh, um, under the US or UK or any other law. So that makes it quite important that this contextualization, it can be seen. So by sub data subject, by source, but also by context uh, itself. So that gives already the next, let's say, makes it more intelligent. -y. So uh, uh, um, since this, what we do is fully online, so no copies taken, uh, only runs with admin rights, of course, being able to discover the tables, but read only. Uh, um, uh, that makes it extremely dynamic and it be able to cover extreme high resources. And again, I think for the technical people on the call, the most important is that you have actually already pre-configured APIs and that in a very big uh, uh, amount, so that that does not need to be curated, and they can read and uh, uh, discover the tables itself and get the contextual elements in it. So that's how it looks. I I would have loved to give you a demo. By the way, if somebody is interested in a demo, we happily can do it. Just in the for the reason of time, I, I just stick this PowerPoint. Uh, so next point is, uh, um, so they analyze the data on the different data types, as I was saying, uh, and then it can be need to be drilled down. So this is now like the highest level, one of the highest level of uh, seeing it on the, on the data, uh, uh, how it can be visualized. So that's always good to have a visualization. However, if you, let's keep still to the data retention element. So which means you need then to discover, uh, uh, and keep it simple again, this might be Hoffman in the different databases, also how the uh, elements, uh, how the data is actually flowing. Uh, but next thing is, once you need to delete or anonymize the data, you need to have, find it extremely precise. And so this, uh, which means you need to know which system, which table, which show with column to in, in order to really identify this data uh, automatically and then uh, basically can be deleted. Now, one little point on the deletion. So theoretically, the system could delete it. Uh, uh, however, uh, not only we do not recommend it, we don't never do it uh, uh, for integrity reasons, as we just said before. Uh, however, uh, there is, of course, a different approach if you have uh, a sequential or other database kind of uh, stuff. So you have uh, different options which then can be done and then normally what happens after that is scripting. So be very careful on the data deletion tools which they have, which is on the market. Uh, uh, very often it's not really a data deletion or anonymization tools. Very often it's just an additional layers for interviews and the original data has not been touched for a bit of keep on that. Um, so data flow mapping, as I mentioned, uh, uh, so you see just some simple samples on demo version and you see on the right side that you actually can uh, be able to identify it in different tables. Uh, important on it, he identifies, of course, all the different subjects in uh, different elements or uh, related to a person within all the tables, which means in common fields, uh, but also he combines it. So and the interesting thing how this can be done is also with a dictionary, so which means not in all 
tables are necessarily in all system Michael Hoffman in it. But of course, identifiers, which the Kikila Vista system is actually very powerful to find the link between it. And so we can aggregate all the data which is in it. So a bit uh, in the necessity in the, uh, for, for uh, personal identify information and indirective. So which means you can find them also in, in the systems elements. Uh, uh, you maybe cannot have the Michael Hoffman in it, but you have elements on it uh, which could be uh, problematic in terms of uh, religion or whatever because in some system it has been put uh, uh, thought to be generalized but uh, actually you can find all these kind of things and can get the correct action on it which you call in the catalog which uh, uh, which can which actually is the, the means to also go into the calendar. So uh, I just maybe for the limit of time, which is allocated to me and to the respect of my uh, to the respect of my uh, colleagues uh, who come after me, um, maybe just one additional element uh, I wanted to uh, stress uh, is um, uh, it is more than just identifying deleting personal data. You need to have the whole process. Since you have that, you have actually the, the key to the kingdom for everything which is related. So we, before it was, it was uh, uh, once I was talking about concept management, for example, uh, so this needs to be also automated because to do it in a manual way cannot be done. So if you have a system in terms of concept management, we would just actually link to the system and we can actually identify to the different persons if you are in the concept management, if it's not, if you should have had it and this kind of things and many others, which I skip now for it. Uh, so we have there the different toolings which actually also, uh, combine in order to give also different dashboards. So this was a bit for the DPOs uh, uh, to basically tell uh, um, the whole thing in GDPR, uh, in day-to-day -day operation is also a very strong element in automation. Why? Because you need to, uh, this is one of the elements how you actually control it and controls need to be as much as possible automated in order to be really effective and meaningful and not have just uh, doing intervention uh, twice per year uh, in terms of an audit or stuff like that. This is just not feasible, expensive, and not really very uh, conclusive. So uh, I stopped there to give the right to, my, to, to, to the people who follow me and just be in time. Uh, just two things. If you're interested in a demo, uh, happily to do so, just give me a, you can write to my email and we happily organize uh, something for you. Be careful, it takes at least an hour. But a few other elements I wanted to put on it which are key in this respect. Uh, so the, on the, uh, uh, the G, uh, EDPS and uh, uh, EDP, uh, which you have there and easily to find, you have the slides. And my very last thing dear to my heart, APDL is really a wonderful, great organization where you can exchange information, where you can get really good people uh, uh, working together. So uh, uh, have, please join. I put in the link uh, 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 happily. Uh, we need always uh, people who are interested and active. And uh, voila. This having said that, I give it back to the, uh, to the presenters. So thank you very much for your patience patient uh, uh, um, uh, and uh, see you then. Thank you. So I try to share Thank you very much, Michael. We are just looking if there are any questions in the questions and answers section. Sure. Yes, so this one is Google collecting data in alignment with data privacy laws. Is my collected data safe? <laughs> So uh, I'm not quite sure. Google and safe understood. The rest I couldn't hear. Uh, the, the question was: Is data collecting? Is Google collecting data in alignment with the current data privacy laws? And if so, is the collected data safe? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. A fantastic question, and that's why I put actually. And you will have the things actually detailed answers you have as well uh, uh, in the links which uh, is in the presentations which you will get as well 
just want to remind you in this respect, there was a very important uh, uh, publication from the European Data Protection uh, Board on the 2nd of July uh, last year. And it was in particular uh, exactly addressing this question of which you have said concerning, uh, uh, in this case, uh, 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 cloud and Microsoft and how this is done. So two things that uh, far from being soft, uh, uh, B, uh, it is also quite interesting uh, because maybe financial institutions have it a bit better on the radar, uh, but never in this extent. The point on it is uh, um, that, of course, you will have the usual contractual elements, and I will not repeat what my predecessor already have said. Uh, uh, however, I want to emphasize on one important element on it, which is it's not only, so to keep the responsibility is not only to have uh, 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 the, uh, the contractual elements as mentioned, but uh, as Sandrine said, the additional measures. So what is the additional measures? So in there, it is clearly clear, you need to be able as controller of your data to prove and to monitor this kind of things. So very often this is not taken really well in consideration because once you go into detail and we made a project on that with the uh, Netherlands uh, Court of Justice, uh, uh, where we actually went in acquiring details on it, and then uh, it, you you will discover it might be really tricky, and you might need to really put elements in place, which is a bit of out of common controlling, um, uh, because uh, um, of course uh, um, data centers are in Europe, but that's only. Well, physically, uh, of course, uh, data uh, uh, like log files and others are shared, and that's to the US and everywhere. Even simple elements that this data center are maybe physically in Europe, which is which is super. Uh, however, the control of this data center is not exclusively out of Europe. So we follow the same principle for administrators. Uh, just to say. but <laughs> stop there. I could talk for a long time on that. It's a really passionate topic. Okay, thank you. Uh, there was another question regarding the names of the tools you mentioned in your talk, but as we share the slides afterwards, I think that is easy to, to pick up. Yeah. And the, the final question was, what is the maturity level you observe in the market for companies complying with data deletion requirements? Ha. Oh, thank you. This, uh, I, I love it. Uh, I love the person who asked me that uh, uh, because actually uh, to come back uh, what has been said by the CMBD is a maturity curve. So uh, in short, it is not making too long of an answer. Uh, uh, what is clear, many have started on manual way. So meaning in IT, uh, uh, so the so legal departments and DPOs ask the IT just do it kind of thing, and they started to do piece by so application by application by application. And what we see now, we are even asked to intervene now to really do it in a much more efficient way. Again, with based on tooling, not that we are so much more intelligent, but. The, the, the point is, uh, uh, if you don't do it automated, you spend so much time and in the end you discover that it's still not complete. So, um, uh, uh, so maturity level is increasing a lot. Uh, I have to say, I, made a lot, I make a lot of project on that. Uh, so, which means uh, there is an incredible high demand because once you're trying to solve the issue yourself alone without having the experience and tooling, uh, it's just a, a tremendous, amount of work. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, for your contribution to our privacy conference. And, thank you. And now I would like to introduce our next speaker, who is Steve Miller from Be Secure, and he will talk today about privacy without hardly any compromises, where we will present a small tool set. Thank you. I give the floor to Steve Miller now. Mm, so hello everyone. So my name is Steve Miller. I'm from B Secure, the uh, Luxembourg Cyber Awareness Center. And for those of you who don't know us yet, so we, um, our missions are to explain cyber risks to the population and also give advice on how to use the new uh, modern technologies in a secure way. And to this end, 
we give a lot of trainings, uh, usually more than 1,000 a year. And now, COVID times, it's a bit less, unfortunately, to uh, students in schools, to parents, but also to teachers, and also at conferences like, like this one. And of course, privacy is a very well, important topic for us as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, now, a few years ago, uh, GDPR was introduced, which improved a lot already because it has a lot of implications on how companies um, can uh, handle our data. But unfortunately, not everyone sticks to these rules. Criminals, for instance, uh, they are usually not so much impressed by legislation and punishment. Um, so it's very hard for us, let's say private people, to do anything about it. But actually, as I show you today, there are a kind of a few tools that you can use to get back your privacy uh, facing these criminals. And that's the nice thing. Nice thing. They um, uh, don't necessarily complicate your, your, your life too much. So I will, uh, the first one I, I want to show you, that's something that you probably have seen already. And it's something that you know from your smartphones, and it's the famous uh, permissions. So when you download an app in the App Store, usually uh, your phone asks you, hey, this app requests access to your microphone, to your camera. Uh, do you want to allow this or not? And this is nice because smartphones nowadays are designed in such a way that actually an app cannot just access your, let's say, personal data without you explicitly acknowledging that. And what's nice uh, about uh, modern web technologies is that they use the very same principle in the web as well. So when you go to a website, for instance, a video, co video conference system, then the website also has the possibility to ask you for permission to, to use your microphone, camera, and location maybe. And that's nice because that way we have a convenient use of our browser. We don't have to install an extra app for that but we can open our browser and everything works. But on the other hand, you have full control over your data. So you don't have to explicitly allow this. The problem with that, of course, is once you allow it, it will no longer ask you again for convenience as well. Um, but criminals use this, for instance, to send you fake notifications like these ones, telling you that apparently your antivirus is the license has expired or you're exposed to viruses and you have to click on that notification to behave this uh, to to fix this problem um, unfortunately well of course if you click that link and you get to the criminal site which you usually well tries to launch maybe hacking at hand or try some phishing on you to get your passwords or so um, so what you could do regularly, that's uh, just check the permissions that you gave to the different websites. And that's pretty easy to do. You just have to go in the settings of your browser. There's the privacy and security tab, which you can see the site settings. And then it lists all possible um, permissions that you can give. And for each of them, if you click it, you see the list of websites and you can also delete those. So that's in uh, every Chrome-based browser which is almost every browser nowadays. Uh, and in Firefox, it's just the same, it's, except that there you have to scroll down a bit to see the permissions. So that's the very first thing already. Now, maybe this is, well, I, I know it's cumbersome because you don't do that regularly. It's a good exercise to do it once or several times a year, but not something that you do at the end of every day. And instead, what you can do is use the private mode uh, on every browser nowadays has a private mode. It's not always called private mode, sometimes it's also called incognito mode. And, uh, well, you open it by just creating a new window in your menu. It says new private window in your incognito window. And that kind of, well, gives you some privacy. But how does it actually do that? So normally when you when you browse a website, say a basic website, and a, a Twitter site, and it does not just show you the website, but it also does a lot of further things. For instance, all the images on the website are stored on your computer for later use. What do you mean by that? Well, if you um, visit the website several times, it does not want to download the very same images every time. So for, let's say, performance, it will 
store these uh, images locally in your computer so that it does not have to download them again if you visit the site again. This is called the cache. Um, you may have seen this already when your browser asks you, hey, do you want to clear the cache or so? But that's not all. So it also stores the fact that you visited the, the site in your browser history. It stores everything you type into forms. It stores which files you have downloaded and, of course, also the permissions. And in addition to that, it also stores the so-called cookies. So cookies are small text files uh, which allow websites to store some configuration uh, on your computer. This is often used for logins, for instance. First time you log in into a website, it will store this information in the cookie locally in the computer so that the next time when you visit that website, it will remember you kind of. So your browser will send this information back to the website and saying, hey, I provided this information already. Please, uh, I, I want to stay locked. Unfortunately, these cookies are also used to track you because, uh, well, if you visit the website, it will see, hey, um, you have been here already. And what uh, well, these, let's say, malicious people can do, they can also store the uh, previous locations where have you been so that they can track your exact browsing behavior over time and then uh, give you, let's say, personalized advertisement or something. Mm, what the private mode now does is every time you close the window, it will automatically destroy all this information um, for you. So you don't have to care too much about, hey, what information do you actually want to keep or not? Um, and this is uh, really useful. What it does not do is uh, delete everything that can be this tracking behavior on the network. So this is only locally in the computer. For instance, if you browse a website, Mm, whoever is on the network, for instance, your employer, he will see that, no matter if you use the private mode or not. Mm, that's just normal network behavior. Um, also, what it does not hide is everything that happens on the server. So if you log in to a server with your username and password, no matter if you're in a private mode or not, the web server will see whatever you have provided to the web server, obviously. So as a summary, it deletes everything on the local computer, but not something on the remote servers or on the network. If you want to hide something on the network, well, you can, you can download and then it will cover your tracks also on the network. What I said is not entirely true. Um, Firefox, for instance, has some kind of tracker prevention. It's trackers that try you to track your browsing behavior over time and it has a list of known trackers in the internet and if you enable the enhanced tracking protection which is usually enabled in private mode then uh, you are less exposed to these uh, if you want to well, protect you furthermore for, from tracking there are a lot of browser extensions that you can download so a browser extension is just a small program that you can uh, install and will let's say, improve the behavior of your browser. Mm, extensions can be downloaded from the uh, respective stores. So you have the Chrome uh, web store. You can download extensions for Chrome and all browsers that are based on it, like Microsoft Edge or Opera and so on. And there is the uh, Mozilla web store where you can download extensions. So one of the extensions I want to present is the uh, uBlock Origin. It's an ad blocker. And uh, well, what does it mean ad blocker? What it blocks ads? So it's, it's, uh, it's pretty complicated. Um, except that it does this in a privacy-friendly way. There are many um, ad blockers that well, they do block ads and they do block kind of tracking behavior, but they um, well track you on your own. So they are kind of recording whatever they have blocked and they report it back or even sell it to the third party companies. And Ublock Origin is one of those that does not do that. It's also So what does an app blocker really do? So I take my favorite counterexample website um, where you let's say read an article and first sight you don't really see the articles. There are so many advertisements on that site. Mm, this is how it looks like without an ad blocker. And this is the very same page that I open with an ad blocker in it. So you would just see the header and the article. 
Um, so blocking ads is not only good for preventing tracking, it will also improve, well, the readability of the site, obviously, but it will also improve speed. So the website I'm showing you here, um, well, it took several seconds, I think it was eight seconds to, to open with the ads and less than a second to open without ads. So it's only advantages. There is one downside with this, and that's if you, I mean, blocking ads for every website that you're on. There are a lot of small, let's say, companies or even private people that depend on the income from these advertisements. So if you're blocking systematically all ads, well, they will have much less income and they might lose their business model. There are better, of course, you can always add exceptions. But there are um, also other extensions like the Privacy Badger by the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which only blocks, let's say, privacy sensitive ads. So they also have a list of all advertisement companies that do not stick to the rules and they will block those, but they will keep the ads of the others. Also, they will block uh, known trackers, just like Firefox does, but um, they have a, a much bigger list. And they also block the so-called advanced tracking techniques. So nowadays, it's not only cookies that sort on your computer, but also so-called super cookies. Um, that's uh, they apply scripting techniques, JavaScript, uh, and new technologies which also allow to store configuration on your computer. And that's something that you can usually not disable. So that's why they're called super cookies. They really remain on your computer. Um, and fingerprinting techniques. So that's, for instance, if a website uh, detects uh, your, let's say, the language that your browser uh, is in, maybe the resolution of your screen, uh, the fonts that you have installed, uh, maybe the size of your window and, and stuff. And using all of these criteria, they um, manage to narrow down users really specifically and then identify users without using cookies in any sense. So it's a bit like you're on the street and how do you identify a person? Well, you remember his hair color, you remember his eye color, maybe uh, the, the hat that he usually wears and so on. And that's the thing. Um, uh, what is exactly trackers? So trackers are often uh, contained in social media uh, add-ons, so for instance, uh, a small uh, beneath articles, you often see a form to comment on an article or to share it via social media. They usually track you, but there are also these called um, hidden trackers. They place a uh, very small picture, a one times one pixel a picture uh, from another website, and then that other website will see that you're on this page. Mm, they are really nasty ones, and the uh, privacy badger also blocks these if it's mm, Of course, you can always add uh, exceptions if you say, no, I'm, the, the site no longer works. It will also show you the trackers. And then there's another one which is uh, related, and it's called NoScript, and it blocks untrusted scripts. So scripts is just the uh, functionality that's responsible for animations, for interaction with sites. And of course, they also uh, allow you websites to track you using, for instance, super cookies techniques also relies on, on JavaScript. And what NoScript does is it blocks all this functionality to the very minimum. It also has a whitelist of so things where it knows that it does not track you down. Um, and of course, you can always uh, set up so if the site no longer works for some reason, if it breaks the site, then you can disable temporarily the extension. <clears throat> then there's the last one. Uh, it's called HTTPS Everywhere. And it, what it basically does is whenever you're on, on an HTTP website, it tries to redirect you to the HTTPS, so the secure variant of, of the website, if it is available. Um, why is this actually important? So usually when you browse a website, Type in the address and it will Google it and then it will show you the website in the browser. The request that you're actually sending to the website is of course done through your internet provider and through your, your uh, router that sits at home. But actually the request does not 
go directly to the website. So if you're somewhere in Europe and the website is somewhere else in Europe, then um, the request, as I said, does not go directly to the website, but through the internet. And the internet consists of many, many of these routers. So, and we will not choose the geographically, let's say, most logical way, but some more or less random way. And maybe you know from the old days, uh, where we had, uh, let's say, normal phones, if someone was phoning in the house and you would pick up any other phone in the house and you couldn't actually listen to what other people were speaking. And this is also true in the internet. So at every of these routers, intermediate routers, everyone could theoretically listen uh, what you're talking and then we'll see what you're doing on the website. And try to keep that. With HTTPS, this is not possible because HTTPS encrypts the communication between you and the website. So whoever is in between does not see the actual test, but just some really. Um, Firefox also, and well, HTTPS everywhere, that extension prevents that in by just redirecting to the HTTPS side. Firefox also has this mode included. Um, it's called HTTPS only mode. You can, it's disabled by default. You can enable it in all windows. You can also enable it only in private rooms. As, as I said, the encryption between you and any server is encrypted with HTTPS. But what is not the case, that is the content that you're actually sending to is of course not encrypted in your browser because you have to see the website. And it's also not encrypted on the server. So even though the communication between you and the server is kind of protected from other people listening to it, whatever is on the server, well, is able to track you down. This is, for instance, true when you're browsing, but also when you're sending email. So when you're sending an email to someone, usually the, say, the process of sending is secured, but the fact that your email is on the mail server is not. When you send an email, it's stored on the mail server, and that mail server is able to read the email, which is normal because it has to know where it needs to send the email to. Now, in the past, big mail providers, for instance, Google, they uh, read through private email to see what, well, to, to create some kind of profile of the users and then uh, show, say, personalized advertisement to that user. So that's also kind of privacy infringing. Of course, nowadays it's no longer legal, but as we say, yeah, it's just because it's not legal doesn't it doesn't give us a guarantee that it's not uh, uh, still the, uh, done. There is a possibility for us that we can actually prevent this. It's called end-to-end uh, -end encryption, and uh, there is actually a, a very nice tool. It's called Pretty Easy Privacy, or PAP for short, and um, it's compatible with mm, the biggest email clients like Thunderbird and Outlook, but also for email clients your uh, Android or iPhones. And uh, it actually encrypts not only the content between you and the mail server, but between you and the recipient of the email. Of course, the recipient of the email also needs to have this uh, this privacy installed, otherwise it, it will not be able to, to decrypt it. If that's a bit too complicated for you, what you can also do is, uh, instead of encrypting the entire email, maybe encrypt a document. And standard office already has this functionality implemented. It's in the file menu. There's a, a button called protect document and encrypt with password. You can provide a password and it will encrypt it. And only that person who has a password can open the file. Mm, of course, one thing that you have to remember is if, if you're sending the file, please do not put the password in the email. I've seen this several times already. And also, please don't send a second email with the password. I mean, that's something that we know from banks. They would send us our, our PIN code in a letter and then the, the, the credit card in a second letter. But in uh, the digital world, it's a bit different because whatever hacker has access to your mail account has access to all emails and not just to one. So it doesn't make sense to send two emails, one with a document, one with a password. Instead, use any other channel like WhatsApp, Messenger, or um, 
let's say classic SMS or phone the person or talk to the person in real time, in the real life. That's all. The same problem also exists for uh, cloud storage. So if you're using Dropbox or Google Drive, OneDrive, and your files are automatically synchronized with the cloud, which is nice, which is useful, uh, good for backups, but all your files remain unencrypted on the cloud as well. If you don't want that, because theoretically everyone who has access to the server, and that I, I include hackers, for instance, they are able to well, steal your file. There's also a solution for that. It's called CryptoMajor. It's also a free and open source solution, which kind of is between you and the cloud provider and encrypts the files before they are being put uh, to the cloud storage. So this is completely transparent and it also works with all or maybe most uh, cloud storage providers. And in that case, all files are also stored and encrypted on the now there's a last tool that I want to show you. Um, it's included in, in Windows, unfortunately only in Windows uh, Pro, so the Pro Professional Edition of it, Pro and Enterprise, not in the Windows Home Edition, and also uh, only in Windows 10. Uh, what is the sandbox? Well, essentially it's what I, I showed you before for the browser, it's some kind of private mode for Windows. So it opens another Windows in your Windows, and whatever you do in that browser is destroyed once you close the sandbox. But it's very useful for all kind of privacy stuff. Mm. Also, because there is no interaction between the sandbox and your real documents, your real files, your real calendar, email, contacts, whatever, on your actual computer, it's it's really great if you want to test, for instance, a suspicious file that you receive by email and you're not sure is it a virus or not, just put it in your sandbox and open it there. If you are able to open it, well, fine, okay, great, and you can read it. And if, uh, let's say, a program crashes, it's most likely a virus. Also, if you're forced to run an app, for instance, by your employer and to say, hey, run this app and you're not sure, I mean, is he trying to spy on me? Or what, why exactly does he want to uh, want me to execute it? And you can also run it in the sandbox and you're sure that it does not have access to any of your, of your personal data. Um, how to install it? As I said, it's provided uh, with Windows 10 Pro by default, but it's not enabled. So you have to turn the Windows feature you type in Windows features in the uh, Windows search bar, and then you can check the Windows sandbox button. Uh, I believe you need to restart your computer, and then it's available in your start uh, menu as a normal program. Okay, so that's it. That's a very small tool set that I showed you. If you have any further questions, feel free to ask them now. Also, we have on our website, the bsecure.lu, we have a lot of guides and a lot of other tools that we present. Mm, if you have any questions or, let's say, urgent issues, you can also phone us. We have a free and anonymous helpline um, where a lot of very kind and very competent people are assisting you. If you have a question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, actually, we have uh, two questions. Uh, one is about uh, alternative channel to send passwords, and the question is, is it secure to send a password over a different channel like Slack um, that is still linked to the email address? Usually it is. So uh, the, the, the fact is just, well, why two channels? Um, the reason for that is that if a hacker managed to get access, for instance, to your email account, then it still has no mean to kind of uh, access, let's say, your other channel. The problem with, when you mention explicitly this, let's say, scenario where you use your email address to log in into Slack, then of course, if a hacker has access to your email account and he's able to reset your Slack password and then, well, still get kind of access to the password. But, uh, okay, in, in that scenario, I, I, I agree, in that scenario, it might not be a good idea to send it over Slack. Uh, 
That's true. But in general, it's pretty, it's pretty safe. There is a second question, and this is, are there recommended open source and safe solutions that could be a good alternative to the most common office collaboration platforms? Uh, there is. Um, it's called actually uh, Nextcloud, and uh, it has a, an office included. Now, I forgot the name. I believe it's Nova office. I, I'm not quite sure. But there is an extension for, for Nextcloud where you can use it. The only problem with that is that you have to install it on your own. So it's not something that's readily usable, or at least not something I'm aware of. I'm pretty sure that there are companies outside that uh, host a Nextcloud platform which you can use either for free or, or paid. I believe it's paid. But I'm, I'm afraid I cannot name any here just because I also do not want to say promote a specific company but there are solutions yes. thanks and there is a, a final question do you think that uh, linux desktops could be a viable alternative to help protecting your data and privacy sorry what desktops uh, uh, yeah it's the uh, eternal question if, if mac and, and linux are safer than microsoft windows um, in terms of privacy there are linux distributions that you can use which are really uh, focusing on privacy for instance tails is one of those um, but there you really have to i mean it's really made for paranoid people because like every browser or every window is executed in different contexts and, and you cannot share things between one and the other. I, I believe even clipboard, if you copy and paste something in one app, it does not work in the other app and stuff. Of course, if you're really paranoid, then I would recommend you to use it. But there is always that, you know, there's the convenience part and there's the security and everyone has to find kind of the, the balance between the two. Mm, I would not say that by default Linux is uh, safer than Microsoft Windows, either from security nor from a privacy perspective, it's always how you use the technologies. So even on, on Linux, you can be tracked down. Even on Linux, you can get viruses and keyloggers that, um, that spy on your computer and, and, and exfiltrate your data. It's not something that's in the technology. It's something that's in our behavior of using we have one more question. Are there sandboxes for Apple devices? Sandbox is for, sorry, what? For Apple devices. Um, of course, I mean, the sandbox is something that's integrated in, in Windows 10 now. It's very easy to install, um, but it's not a feature that it's very new. So uh, for those of you who know virtual machines, a virtual machine is kind of, and uh, let's say an, a program that simulates a, an entire computer and uh, there is a virtual machine which is free and open source it's called virtual box it's a program that you can download and then it provides you with a machine you can install a uh, operating system in it so other linux and, um, and uh, windows well mac not so much but it it works if you know how to do it and then you can do whatever you want to do it within the virtual machine. VirtualBox is available for all major operating systems. So as well for Windows, as for Mac, as for Linux. But you can only boot, you, you can only start a Windows or Linux within the virtual machine. Okay. But yes. Okay. No further questions. Then thank you very much. And see you some other time. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, coming to our next speaker, who is Ove Langfeld, the Legal and Policy Officer for Data Protection from the EU Commission. And he will talk today uh, about GDPR at two and a half years now. So where do we go from here? If I now may give the floor to Ove, you're welcome. Yes, hello. Thank you for having me. Um, I hope my video is working as well as my sound. On my cell view, I'm still very privacy friendly, completely blurred, not only my background. 
Actually, we can hear you very well, but we can't really see you. <laughs> Is this better? Sorry, just one second to get everything up and running. That was an interesting observation on. It works now. Facial recognition, because apparently the blurring of the background didn't recognize my face is not part of the background. I should move more. Um, technical possibilities or issues aside, uh, thank you very much for having me here. I'm aware that I'm the last uh, obstacle between all of you and lunch, so I promise to keep this uh, brief and hopefully entertaining. Now, of course, it's quite an honor to be speaking about GDPR as the latest um, big privacy law on the 40th anniversary of its, let's say, grandfather, the Convention 108 mentioned all the way in the beginning of the morning. And indeed, GDPR is one of the main tools used in the EU to keep uh, companies and the public sector accountable, so make sure that they um, treat data appropriately. Data protection in a way is maybe not the best name because it's not about data, but about people in the end, protecting people against powerful organizations. I set out rules on how to, how they should treat the data about people. So what are the rules? And I, of course, that's a long story, but the one sentence version is have a good reason for what you're doing, be transparent about it, and do it securely. In that sense, it's like the code of the road. It's not about stopping people from driving or processing personal data, but about making sure that it's done in a way that avoids people getting run over or in the street example, or in our example, that they are unduly negatively affected um, by the processing. So the whole approach of GDPR is about this reconciliation. Now, many of the principles in, in it are not new, but further developments of things that were already in the old data protection directive and uh, some cases even in the old, in the uh, convention 108, uh, as mentioned by Ms. Lemma earlier today, um, indeed the GDPR public awareness grew a lot. It may also be due to the possibilities uh, of really strong fines, which uh, definitely raised awareness in the um, management flaws of many big companies. So that is by way of general introduction and the GDPR is kind of a main part of the EU's human-centric approach to regulating technology and the compass on the use of technology in the uh, transitions that come up both green and digital and it helps to provide trust in processing so that people actually do use the possibilities afforded by the digital transition. So. What I'm going to talk about a bit more in detail, um, as said, GDPR two and a half years old, a bit on the evaluation the Commission did publish last summer. Then, of course, um, other important developments this year. We already had an earlier intervention on data flows, so a bit on that and also the, the road ahead. Then data protection into COVID. Now, from then, more from our perspective, we already had um, the presentation from the Luxembourg DPA on really on the ground, the practical implications, and I'm going to I'm going to complement that a bit from the European perspective, and wrapping up with a look ahead, both on what is going to happen in the general, say both on GDPR specifically, but also in the um, general say, policy space on data writ large. 
So, uh, on the GDPR evaluation um, published last summer, 26th of June, both a commission communication and a more detailed staff working document um, providing additional details. Um, doing this report is something we were explicitly tasked to by GDPR with um, a focus specifically on the transfer issue, international transfers issue, and how the uh, cooperation and consistency mechanism works, because that was one of the big new changes compared to the system under the old directive. But um, while we were preparing that, the Parliament, European Parliament, requested to take a broader view, not only these specific points, so we took that into account. And of course, you can imagine that if a document is published in June, it didn't, we didn't start writing it in May, but there is a longer story behind. Of course, as soon as uh, GDPR got adopted back in 2016, we kept a look on how member states were preparing for the new rules, we had a first stock taking exercise in July 2019, and of course also uh, collected extensive feedback from stakeholders, be it data protection authorities, the member states, and so on. So, what are our main findings then? Um, short version, and this is something um, that came out through many of the presentations today. GDPR works organizations are thinking about how to get their data house in order. Um, also on the side of data subjects, people are aware of GDPR, that they have certain rights, that they have, um, for example, the right to have access to be informed about how the data are processed, that they can complain to their DPA. There have been hundreds of thousands of complaints and um, in many member states also a large rise in the number of complaints dealt with compared to what the DPAs dealt with before. So enforcement is up and running and also as Mr. Lemmer mentioned earlier because I admittedly also mentioned the fines earlier and the upper limit of the fines are indeed very impressive, up to 4% of global turnover for the worst cases. But the fines are, while they are indeed the headline grabbing part of the DPA's enforcement powers, um, other possibilities, such as ordering a ban or a limitation of processing, can be a lot more effective in bringing about the behavior change on the part of controllers, which is what is actually behind it. Um, so on that in general, first finding GDPR has indeed empowered citizens and they are using their, their rights. Second, the governance system with the independent data protection authority in the member states and their cooperation for cross-border cases also within the data protection board is working. Of course, setting up a such a new governance system for cooperation um, takes a while to set up because, and this is let's say a 30 second historical parenthesis, if you compare the European Data Protection Board to its predecessor, the work, Article 29 Working Party, its task and uh, ways of working have changed quite significantly. The old Working Party 29 issued guidelines and opinions, which the EDPB still does, but it also has a much more um, structured and um, also deadline, deadline bound way of working in cross border cases on actual enforcement of the rules to coordinate there between the lead and the and the concerned supervisory authorities. So that is a huge change 
in how cooperation between the DPAs work. Um, and cooperation is improving. Um, one of the findings from our evaluation report was indeed it could still be better. The board is also very much aware of this and has is working on it to make the cooperation procedures run more smoothly. And in doing that, the board of course has uh, the commission's full support. So governance mechanism up and running for improving. Third, um, on the relationship with innovation, the risks caused by processing. This is also something that I mentioned earlier. Now, one of the big changes in the GDPR compared to um, the earlier data protection directive, as it was then transposed in the member state, is a larger focus on the risks of the processing, meaning that uh, the um, safeguards to be taken, the analysis that organizations need to do depend on the risks caused by the processing to a larger extent than they did before. So that you know, if your organization is the um, philatelist club of Luxembourg and your main processing of personal data is your mailing list and checking that people paid the members use. The risks are, of course, lower than when you are a hospital implementing a completely electric patient management system. And this is one thing where GDPR aligned obligations to the risks. And in a way linked to that is also additional new rights, such as the right for portability, meant to also give uh, an edge or a further possibility to improve competition here and um, limit uh, lock-in effect by um, certain large providers of certain services. I don't have to name any names. Um, that is, let's say, a, what we found on the relationship to innovation part. Um, of course, we are aware that there have been calls, especially from uh, small enterprises, to help them a bit more. And indeed, um, we are looking into what can be done to um, help people along, not changing the routes. The routes should stay as they are, but let's say practical guidance and for example what we have done in this case we had a funding program for data protection authorities for um, outreach programs or information programs to help uh, SMEs comply more easily. Then um, fourth main part one of the big um, characteristics of GDPR and even going back before that, uh, basically the whole European approach to data protection compared to the side of the Atlantic is the technologically neutral approach, which we still believe. And I think also recent experience has shown that it works is a key to ensuring that um, new technologies, um, whatever they may be, will be developed in full compliance with fundamental rights um, while still providing some flexibility. I'm going to come back to that a bit on the relationship, uh, especially with the COVID pandemic a bit later. But first, um, a few words on transfers. We already earlier had seen the um, Sandrine's presentation on data transfers in the academic sense. Now, lots of things happened. Many things are still happening. 
as a kind of general commission position, we believe that there is a need for a modern transfer toolbox covering you know, different business models, different countries of destination. That is our line of thinking about this to basically enable free data flows with trust and to make sure that uh, protection follows or travels with the data in our uh, let's say response to the Schrems 2 judgments. Uh, one important work of that is indeed, as mentioned earlier, the um, publication of the new standard contractual clauses, currently still in draft. I don't have to repeat earlier presentations, published in November. EDPB, EDPS joint opinion landed earlier this month. Now we're in the process of implementing the feedback given and the aim is to have them publish in their final version in spring probably around March. So then there will be a big new part of the toolbox for ensuring that transfers, international transfers of personal data happen in compliance with GDPR. Now, of course, they're not a magic solution, and that was also alluded to earlier, because you know, additional measures may need to be taken based on a case-by-case -case assessment on the transfer, where it's going, your threat model, basically. But we do believe that the new clauses will offer companies a practical checklist on, on what to look at and a useful toolbox on what they still need to be doing now. Um, how this assessment on additional safeguards is to be done, that is of course also explained in recent guidance of the EDPB, which just like the clauses were um, open for public consultation and many stakeholders did provide comments there. Now, of course, to the extent possible, we would like to be both um, the clauses prepared by the Commission and the additional guidance by EDPB to be convergent. That convergence is important to ensure legal certainty. Now, as you've seen, there are some open questions, for example, on the, how far the risk-based approach can play a role. Um, That is something that indeed then will feed uh, further discussions in EDPB. Um, as you know, Commission takes part in the activities of the EDPB, of course, without a voting right that is reserved only for the uh, data protection authorities. But we are involved, we take part in discussions and defend and approaches that are you know, both legally solid and also practically useful and operational. That on the standard contractual clauses. I talk mostly about transfers, but as also mentioned earlier, there's in the shadow, let's say, of the transfer discussions, the other set of standard contractual clauses for control of process and relationships um, is going through the same process at the same time, with the same uh, time frame. So also on that, there will be an update coming soon. So much about the clauses, uh, which are indeed as well, the big story in international transfers right now. But of course, there are other transfer instruments such as uh, adequacy decisions, recognizing that a third country provides an essentially equivalent level of protection. There's a list of, this of these countries. It is for now not that long, but we are engaged in, um, in talks with other international partners, um, especially South Korea is very close to being finalized. Uh, we also contribute to the work on international organizations in the field of 
global standards on data transfers, for example, the OECD. And to conclude on transfers, um, we are, of course, also talking to the United States after you know, privacy street was invalidated to explore the possibility of a strengthened new framework for transatlantic data transfers. That is definitely a priority for us. It's also recognized in the new EU, EU US agenda for global change adopted by the commission. So we're ready to explore solutions there, including creative ones, but of course there can be no quick and dirty fix. Any solutions or new framework will have to be fully in line with the Trump's two judgment. And that does mean convincingly meeting the court's requirements on limitations to government access for national security purposes. And also on individual redress. So new standard contractual clauses coming soon. Adequacy decisions in the making talks with US, um, watch this space, things will evolve. Then moving on to the uh, rather uh, the COVID issue, there were also quite some uh, developments on the European level. So for example, early in spring, similar similar timing as uh, the EDPB guidance mentioned by Mr. Lemma earlier. The commission provided guidance and recommendations to member states, for example, on apps supporting the fight against COVID-19 and has developed technical specifications for an interoperability gateway between national warning apps in the EU. Now, just to give an example, th this gateway is now up and running more and more member states um, are using it. So it's testing that new member sites get connected to that. And this will allows people to receive alerts and declare infections also from abroad using their own home countries app. So that can hopefully be very useful when we get to travel more frequently again. That as one example, there's another example where the commission is working currently with the member states on a platform for exchange of data extracted from passenger locator forms which similarly to the gateway for tracing app would um mr langfeld it um, seems to be we lost you are you still there i am still there yes i also just got the notification due to issues my video was cut i'm trying to see if i can wait liberate some bandwidth is this better now um it i can see you again and i can hear you now okay sorry for the technical problems uh, this sometimes happens um so um yes just to um speed up and wrap up there. Um, work is going on on a platform to exchange information from passenger locator forms, um, similar to the gateway for tracing app that would uh, help to improve uh, cross-border contact tracing for limiting or combating the, the uh, spread of COVID-19. Now, of course, for all of these things, uh, the safeguards and GDPR apply. So data minimization principle only exchange what is really necessary for the specific purpose. And that is a line that yeah, in general applies to all of the responses to the pandemic, both let's say on the more operational level by individual controllers, but also on the legislative part with the rules member states enact. Um, again, Mr. Lemmer said earlier, I gave an example of the legislation that 
the Luxembourg government consulted their DPA on and similar consultation processes are happening on COVID related laws in all the member states to ensure that any new measures are indeed proportionate and limited to what is necessary. And I think that you know this process has also shown that uh, GDPR does allow the um, sufficient flexibility to address these issues. So for example, in the rule on processing of health data, there are specific rules for processing for based on for public health purposes based on union or member state law, which address many of the needs, for example, on contact tracing. So in that sense, a GDPR is really part of the solution there and not an obstacle to it. Why part of the solution? Because it enables the what, trust by people in the um, replies to the pandemic enacted by their member state. So I th really think we can say that uh, while GDPR has been tested, that it's stood that test on having stood the test and now really being conscient of time. Um, what other new things are going to happen? Um, the Commission has no intention to reopen GDPR right now. What matters now is really enforcement that is for the national data protection authorities to do. They are more and more using the tools at their disposal. So things are on a good track there. In general, on how member states have implemented uh, GDPR, the Commission is in bilateral contacts with the member states to. Um, for example, also look into some of the uh, specification clauses that were mentioned earlier. Um, one remaining bit of, um, if you know, remember a long time ago when GDPR was still a proposal under the general heading of reform of the EU data protection framework, we also had the e-privacy directive and a proposal for a new e-privacy regulation. That is the last bit of that framework reform that is still missing. Um, we are committed to work with the uh, current Portuguese presidency and the European Parliament to finish this important file. Now, and. 60 seconds at the end, also linking back to what was sent in the introductory speech. Um, GDPR focuses on ensuring that individuals' data are handled responsibly, if you want to be really sure. Uh, its thinking comes really from this individual perspective. Now, as mentioned in the beginning, in the introductory speech, um, there are, of course, also other more, let's say, systemic or societal implications of data processing at a large scale. And on that, the Commission has also come out with new proposals at the end of the year, Digital Services Act and Digital Markets Act, which um, address the let's say, digital sphere from a different, rather, let's say, systemic perspective. Um, so there are rules on, let's say, ad transparency, which can, in the DSA, which was example for this different approach and the aims pursued by that. Um, those are where well, they were published just before Christmas. And now the co legislator are gearing up. The European Parliament recently appointed its rapporteurs on this. So this will be another big file to watch in the, let's say, general data space. So 
wrapping up um, GDPR at two and a half. It's walking, it talks, it's on a good path. Um, there are other issues on, let's say, how society uses data that cause implications that go beyond protecting the individual. And for those also, we have these other proposals out that seek to address those additional issues. And on this, I thank you for your attention and can, if we have still a bit of time, um, take some of the questions that I see from the text, but of course, I don't want to um, keep you from your lunch either. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. We still have time for the few questions. So I think if this is okay for you, mm. you can uh, freely answer them. So I see in here in the QA set um, on lots of international aspects. I'll start then with the very first question that came in um, the kind of international outreach of uh, GDPR. Um, and the question that while indeed Convention 108 is also open for adoption by or signature by non-Council of Europe member states, and there are some that have done it, um, that has gained that much speed while on the other hand you, you see that indeed um, when other countries outside Europe adopt data protection laws they take inspiration from GDPR let's say so many of the concepts we see that are the same and there are by now more than 150 countries with data protection laws in the world um, now of course I can't read the minds of the legislator in those third countries but it stands to reason that if you um, model your rules on GDPR you will um, more easily be able to show that it would indeed be essentially equivalent to GDPR so you probably have an easier time when asking for adequacy if the architecture of your law mirrors that. Um, then, linked to uh, specifically on adequacy decisions, um, because indeed I mentioned South Korea, I did not specifically mention the UK. Um, it's progressing, but no, I can't give a, any specific timeline um, on DPIAs and that. Now, the way it is set up is that doing a DPA is indeed an obligation on the controller. Some DPAs have also published frameworks on how to do DPIAs, which can help there. And finally, um, the again by comparison to other fields uh, do good things and talk about them so those organizations that have done dpas which they are confident uh, show the risk and what can be done about them um could publish them uh, as you know examples now with the commission perform dpias in that sense that is from the um, architecture of gdpr not specifically our role unless of course we ourselves are controllers and the kind of measuring regulation that applies to the european institutions uh, also foresees that so that indeed can come and the
last one or two, two last ones, a specific scope of uh, south korea adequacy um i have to admit i personally not my file and on new version of gdpr following the evaluation as as i said um it's There are currently no plans to reopen the whole package on, on our side. Um, it's been applied for two and a half years now. Um, it's really about implementation now and also providing additional guidance to make implementation easier, but no plans to reopen now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ulva. So it's now only me standing in between you and lunch, I suppose. So first of all, I would like to say, if you need a certificate of attendance, feel free to contact communication at christina.lu. That's no problem. We will send you a certificate of attendance. And secondly, I would like to say thank you to all our contributing partners, beginning with the CNPD, the APDL, Nota Dotil, the European Commission, Be Secure, and Ristina and the University of Luxembourg. So, and then to close the session, I would like to invite you to join us back in October for the Cyber Day conference. The date is not set yet, but we will keep you all updated. And then I would be very proud to invite you for next year's conference, which will take place again on the same date, on the same location, probably here at the University of Luxembourg in Delval, I hope. So this year we were online, I hope that I can invite you to visit us next year again, face to face. At least I hope it, I really hope it. So conference date for next year will be the 28th of January, 2022. I hope you had a fruitful session today. And now I wish you a good lunch, enjoy your lunch and stay safe. Thank you very much and see you back next year.